friends, it is nice to start this Katha on Sri Ramakrishna. Now you see the word Katha kind of conjures up an image of trying to do you know, stories about Puranic tales, legendary ancient tales. The, word, the Katha you are going to hear is a contemporary Katha, a modern narrative. Now it is very important to recognize the, the, the use of narratives when you are talking about very subtle ideas like spirituality. You see, without the narrative, without the story format, however good the philosophy may be, it becomes dry and you feel that you are chewing on dry you know, straw, it becomes tiresome. A story allows you to kind of bring in lovely, marvelous ideas of spirituality in a story format. This is the uni unique feature about all the Kathas. In fact, if you look at the reason why we are attracted to say, watch entertainment on television, see the films, the reason is this. In a way, as we are human, the way we can relate to human ide to, to ideas about anything has to be in human terms. That is why we love to watch the soap operas. In a way, we are living the lives of those personalities, you see, through those stories. That's why we get hooked to, to all these kind of soap operas and television. Because we live in a way, all of us attach ourselves to certain characters in that particular story and live their lives. So you can see the power of narrative. It can be used or misused. You see, if you look at the soap operas, any soap opera, Eastern or Western, the soap operas will focus on kind of lower human aspiration. There is jealousy. You know, all this Hindi soap opera, ZTV is over. The clothes are out, you know, come on, you know, killed. There is jealousy, there is deviousness, there is deception. So you can promote very kind of poor kind of human aspirations or lower human aspirations through narratives and that still hooks you. In the same narrative, the power of narratives, you can again write the back of narratives to aspire to higher ideals. This is the power of Kathas. In fact, the reason why the Hindu population is fixated on the Kathas is purely for this reason. Because when you hear the stories of Ram or Krishna or all these various Kathas, Bhagavad Katha, Ramayana, Mahabharata, you, you immediately start linking up with some of those characters. And you, in a way, you leave your, you, you kind of ride on the back of those characters to develop those characteristics in our lives. We kind of borrow from them. That is why Kathas are such a powerful tool that the Hindus have recognized and used for thousands of years to promote high, high principles through stories, through the stories of Ramayana, through the stories of Mahabharata, through the stories, through the stories of say, the Bhagavad Puran. Marvelous ideas. But again, you see, this is the, 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 the power of the storytelling. But one thing that is putting off the youth of modern times, put them off the Kathas, is this. As the Kathas have been told over so many thousands of years, as they have been told, bits were added and bits were taken away. Bits were subtracted, bits, bits were added on. This is understandable because depending on the audience, the storyteller will always kind of adjust his story to suit the needs of the audience he is dealing with. And if this has been happening over thousands of years, the account you get today perhaps have no bearing to what actually happened. It may have lost complete touch with reality. And this is one of the drawbacks of Kathas because Kathas sometimes have become so exaggerated that a modern youth will shy away from it saying, look, I like these lovely personalities, but you know, some of these kind of ideas they are conjuring up do not match up with reality. And a modern youth will, of course, that's why if you look at all the Kathas being shown on television, and look at the camera moving at the audience, there will be hardly any youngster. Only a few children playing about and the rest elderly people like me with the teeth falling out, hair falling out, just about you know, kind of chewing cud, <laughs> bit of religious entertainment. So this is kind of visible in the, this is why the Kathas, even though they are very potent, as I said, the power of narrative to carry the audience on higher ideals is a very important tool that we must use. And yet, because this thing has been done over thousands of years and you are stuck in a rut with just legendary stories, they have become counterproductive to the needs of the modern youth because they can't relate to it anymore. They say, look, if you want to just talk about you know, good over evil, we might as well watch Star Wars. Why should we watch Hanuman anymore? Because the same ideas are there except they are done in modern format with all these you know, kind of gizmos, R2-D2 and all the rest of them. Might as well go for that. So why should we bother with say Hanuman and Ramayana? They are super stories, marvelous stories, but we can adopt modern ones rather than fall back on the antique ones. So the modern youth will shy away. 
And the other problem is this. The Kathakas do not give a health warning to their audience, especially the youth. They treat these Kathas with a lot of, you know, use your common sense when you are interpreting the Kathas. And decide for yourself to what extent this, are, this is reality and to what extent is pure narration, pure, pure storytelling. You must make the distinction. If you do not make the distinction, it will come, if you like, you come in conflict with rationality, common sense and science. It will really offend you. It will put you away, put you off religions altogether. So this idea of Katha is powerful, but just restrain yourself to things that happened thousands of years ago and you are not really sure to what extent this is historic or to what extent it's just made up, is becoming, if you like, has a limited validity in modern times. And this is very visible. So why should the Hindu religion, you know, allows this idea that you evolve with the times. As time moves on, the way you relate to spirituality must be presented in a modern format. It allows for evolution. So why don't we evolve? But you see, we have a problem. Like all animals who want to evolve, they are stuck. They don't like to evolve that easily. They have to be prodded. They have to be pushed. You know, they like to, st you know, we don't like to change. All of us are full of inertia. We don't like to lose. We are stuck with inertia. So, you see, we have to be pushed and hopefully make further progress. So, you see, the importance of Katha is a narrative to put across marvelous philosophic ideas, subtle ideas, abstract ideas in a story format which we can write on and try and incorporate them in our life is a very powerful tool. But do not limit yourself to just the kathas or the stories that came from very ancient past because we can't distinguish what is legendary, what is reality and it puts off the youngsters. So it's necessary to produce a katha or a narrative which is suited to the modern times and this is what we are trying to do today. We are going to look at a personality who is as dynamic as some of the personalities of the ancient Hindus and yet who lived in modern times, in our times. Let me tell you a little bit more before I start actually the story, the narration. You see, if you look at the night sky, you see the moon, you see the stars, you might see a comet pass by, and you say, what are the, how marvelous, you know, you wonder. In the same way, when you look at the religious landscape, you also discover various personalities. Just like the moon, which kind of is, is cooling, produces a cooling effect, you find giants, spiritual giants, who become, if you like, a solace of the, of the scorched hearts of humanity. They, if you like, continue to radiate tremendous kind of calmness and coolness that removes some of this kind of heat that we feel when we live our lives. We find such personalities. We also find those little sparkling things right in the background, the ancient sages, been twinkling the message of spirituality without making any fuss, without beating any drums which have influenced our society for thousands of years. The ancient rishis, the sages of India, they sparkle in the background. And we get this wondrous, some, some wondrous personality like a comet going over the, over, over the horizon who come with a grand idea and kind of lit, light up society for a short time. And we also find lots of fireflies, you know fireflies. They kind of buzz about, shine, shimmer, and we wonder what is happening, what is moving them. In the same way, you find these wonderful bhaktas, the devotees, who also dance about, sing and dance in the name of God. They appear on the horizon for a short time, and then they quietly disappear. These are the bhaktas of the Hindu tradition. These are all marvelous personalities that color the landscape of religion of India. But then, once in a while, we suddenly see the sky, the horizon turning pink and we see the rising sun, something dramatic, not only just enhancing and protecting life, but actually giving life like the sun. The spiritual message that comes through from these personalities lights up the whole of this hum humanity. It gives life. It is, the, if you like, the fountainhead of spirituality which the world seriously needs. Such personalities come from time to time and enliven, you know, kind of revive and refresh the powerful message of spirituality suited to their own times. We see them again and again. So today we are going to do a story of one such personality. And again, you know, what's the uniqueness of this personality? There is nothing extraordinary. I'm going to do a story in the most ordinary language of something that is 
extremely extraordinary and yet appears very ordinary. The unique feature of these modern personalities is telling us, don't you see the extraordinary is intertwined with what appears as ordinary. All of this appears ordinary. It is charged to the full with spirituality, extraordinary, hidden or appearing as ordinary. So I am going to be very careful to present a, a story which has got some kind of mystical element, but I am going to keep them low, I am going to keep it low, I don't to fly off. I am going to present this in a very kind of simple terms, in simple language, but a story that is extremely extraordinary. Let us begin the journey. You see, in, in Bengal, in eight, early 1800s, lived a family, a very pious family, very devout, pious family, Brahmin family. They lived in a little village called Kamarpukur, which is about 60 miles northwest of Calcutta. A little village, very simple people, very pious, simple, well, middle class to poor family. Now, before I start the story of this great personality, let me just tell you something about his predecessors. A young person called Khudiram lives here. What is the unique feature about this simple man? He lives a very simple life. He's got some land which he cultivates and survives on the money. This person, the whole life of this person, look at the way he leads his life. It is so strongly God-centered rather than self-centered or materialistic life. It's a spiritually driven life. How does it become visible? Look, in every Hindu home, wherever you find, the center of attraction is no longer the television, but the shrine room. They say, unless the deity that we are worshipping is looked after first, we won't even eat or drink. This is the discipline they show. They very clearly show the priorities. The priority is spirituality and not just the material existence. And this becomes visible in the story of this, this gentleman, this man called Khudiram. Very devout, very pious, devoted to the idea of, of, of God as Raghuvir, Ram. A great devotee of Raghuvir. Again, until Raghuvir is fed, until Raghuvir is looked after, the family won't even drink a, you know, a drop of water. Devout, disciplined, with the priorities in the right way around spirituality above a material living. Now, just show you the power of this gentleman. Because he was so honest and straightforward, at one stage he used to own a lot of land. And the landlord in that particular area, for some reason, decided to take some other person to task and ask Khudiram to become a false witness so that he can win a court case. And Khudiram said, I will not play ball. I cannot bear false witness. So the landlord got angry with Khudiram and said, oh, no, no. If you don't play ball with me, I'm going to pinch your land because I can extend my claim onto your land too. And Khudiram had to abandon his land. He lost, he abandoned the land and walked away with his family. And some other friend said, come, I'll give you a small piece of land which you can cultivate and survive. He said, rather do that. He left and walked. You see, the, the, the steadfastness of this principle-oriented personality was very visible. It is, you see, when you find such discipline in any, any family, that the, the, if you like, the groundwork has been done for the, for, the, for the plant of spirituality to flourish. This is the background to this Sri Ramakrishna. So here is this Khudiram. He left his home, left his, king, left his uh, plot of land, and is living on a friend's land and surviving. Very pious. His wife was equally simple woman, very simple woman. In fact, guileless, nirdosh, completely guileless. No complication, very straightforward, very loving, very caring to the, for the neighbors, very simple woman. Again, a marvelous place where spirituality can find roots and show itself, become visible. This is the, the father and mother of this personality, Kudiram and Chandramani. Now the story goes, see, this is a bit of, bit of mystical stuff has to come in to make story interesting. Now one day, see, when this wife was passing by a Shiva temple in the little village called Kamarpukur, this is in her own words, I am not exaggerating, I am very careful, the Kathakars in the future will exaggerate, I will try and keep it to the Lord, <laughs> the minimum. 
She said, as I was passing by the Shiva Mandir, Shiva temple, it's a small tiny, I've been to this place, Kamarpur, it's a small little temple, literally six feet by six, hardly a temple really, just a little thing with a little Shiva Ling inside. And she said, I was passing by, so light come, light come out of the temple and come in huge waves and enter my body. And it was so dynamic, I couldn't bear the experience. And I fainted and fell down and people had to lift me up and take me home. I did not know what happened to me, but from that day I felt I am with a child. This is the kind of magical beginning. Let must give put a little magic and color. Otherwise the story becomes too black and white. It must make it colorful. So this is the she says, I feel I am with a child now. And then after nine months and she she bears the child. The date is Wednesday, 18th of February, 1836. In the home, on this very poor home of Kudiram, the conch shells were blown just before sunrise, announcing the birth of a child. This child, because they are devoted to the idea of Raghuvir, this child was named Gadadhar, which is one of the names of Vishnu. So they, they named the child using the name of Vishnu Gadadhar. Now this child was very simple. At, you know, at the beginning there is nothing extraordinary. He appears like just any ordinary child, goes to school, likes certain subjects, doesn't like some other subjects, he loves art and stuff like, you know, all this play, play acting and memorizing all the, all, the, all the epics, he loves all that stuff. And the one part he hates, we see that we love mathematics, he hates mathematics, doesn't like the times table at all. But never mind, he survived school. So this young boy is being brought up. Now the colors, he begins to show his colors. You see, there is a saying in the Hindu tradition. A child shows his colors when he's in his court. As soon as he gets out of, it, out of his court, he begins to show his colors, his characteristics. And the characteristics of this young boy are very special, very, very special. Let me tell you what happens when he's just about seven years old. One day he's walking in the forest, paddy fields, paddy fields, not forest, paddy fields. He's walking through the paddy fields with other friends and while he's walking you see he looks up he sees lovely new clouds that are formed dark clouds that are just being formed in the skies and he sees a row of white herons passing by nice making a nice formation and passing by over the, under, under, under the black cloud he just looks up now you see the magic real magic of religion this young boy, instantaneously, without any prodding, without any preaching, without any teaching, goes into the highest state of meditation without realizing what it is. He's a seven-year-old little boy. He looks up. Do you know what happens? This is considered the highest spiritual experience any human being can have. This is the height of Hindu philosophy. He has not heard the word philosophy, thankfully. This boy, at the age of seven, looks up and suddenly sees the whole world. You see, the thing is this, this is called spirituality. What is it? You see, we experience this world at this level and we are satisfied with it. We go to dream and you say, this is kind of a weak state of affairs. And when we wake up, this is reality and we feel <clears throat> comfortable with this state of, if you like, experience. When spirituality awakens, the intensity with which you experience the universe goes off a million fold, not even tenfold, thousand fold, million fold, it shoots up and suddenly you see the whole universe in tremendous intensity and what you see is the unity that if you like underpins this reality, one that controls everything, you become one with that, without any prompting, without any preaching, without teaching, without meditation, you experience tremendous intensity. Imagine leading your life, living your life in such intense manner that this wakeful life appears to be like shadow. That clear vision, it's a most unifying experience, unifying, because now you touch base with the reality, your own nature, your own reality, as well as the, the reality that underpins this whole of this creation. You become one with that. There's an intense life-altering experience. The Hindu philosophers have classified this as the highest spiritual experience any individual can have. This is called Brahmagnan. Brahmagnan. 
this lovely term that's at the heart of Hindu philosophy, that's at the underpinning to this reality, is some principle that is very dynamic, that is your essential nature, and the essential nature of everything you come across. That essential nature, you touch base with it, you realize you are that, you are one with the whole of this creation, you become one with reality. This is the most exciting experience, most thrilling experience. This little boy, at the age of seven, you see the first card he plays on the religious field is the trump card, the ace. It starts off with a high, if you like, high note. Of the highest spiritual experience the Hindus have been talking about, saying this is the highest, this is the peak, the height of spiritual experience. You see, there are many different levels of spiritual experiences. You can see God as a personality, you can see God as your inner self, but to see God as underpinning everything and everyone, including myself, is the highest of the high. You can't go any higher. It is a new, non dual, dual experience. There is no differentiation anymore. You hit that jackpot right at the age of seven. He shows his colors. If, of course, you see, this experience is so dramatic. What happens to this? This connection with the body appears such a trivial thing that you discard it. People think it's not some kind of epileptic, epileptic fit that you're going to go and it's not trance. You become more intense than you can ever be. And for that intensity to become visible, the link with the body appears such a trivial thing that you cast it aside, you kick it aside. So you become completely like that, still, completely still. This is not some kind of mental illness. The level of experience is so dramatic and so con you know, contradictory to our living experience that the living experience is discarded, is sh you know, shot aside, sh pushed aside. That is the most dynamic experience. This little chap hits it right at the, you know, at the early stage, the age of seven. He hits the jackpot. And at that level, if you're standing up, you lose body consciousness, the body will topple over. Who cares for the body? You now touch base with reality. And the other boys were frightened. What happened to the little boy? Lift him up, take him home. And later on when he was asked, he told his parents, you know, I was not unconscious. Oh no. There was a tremendous flow of bliss through my whole being. I was fully awakened, awake. It's, no, it's not a dozy experience. You don't, you know, you don't become unconscious. You become super conscious, not unconscious. This is what called spirituality. He said, I, I was full of bliss. I could see the whole of this creation, but nothing but bliss. And I can no longer see the distinction. You see, the thing is, we distinguish. He sees the whole of this in one. He doesn't see the variation, he sees one. So the variation disappears. That is a unifying experience. And it's life-altering. So this little boy shows his colors. You know, he belongs to the, the high note of spirituality. He's no ordinary person. In fact, let me just touch on this. His disciple, his principal disciple, became very world famous, called Swami Vivekanan, rarely talked about Sri Ramakrishna, rarely talked about him. He said, do you know why? At the best, I can show the breadth of his vision, the kind of comprehensive ideas of spirituality that he promotes. But I can never fathom the depth of his personality. I fail. He said, I fail. That's why I don't want to talk about him. He hardly talked about his master once or twice in his lifetime. He said, because the depth is so much, I will do him this, you know, disservice if I do that. So I'd rather not do it. But of course, he can say that, but people like me will brattle on. <laughs> <laughs> We don't mind, we, whatever happens, you see, we kind of shudder and we, you know, like an empty tin, we shudder and, you know, kind of start rattling. So we rattle, never mind. So this is the depth of his, he says, I can't fathom the depth of this personality. So I will avoid talking about him. But we are stuck, so we'll do it, do the katha on poor chap. So this is the, this is the personality. At the age of seven, he hits this jackpot, high note of spirituality. At the same time, at the age of seven, a, you know, kind of a mishap happens in the family. The father passes away at a very young age. It is said if a boy loses a father at a very young age, because the boy always looks up to the father for a kind of rational understanding, explanation about the world, become worldly wise. And suddenly if at a very young age the father is taken away, the boy will pay a price. He became very withdrawn now. This boy became very withdrawn. And he started going on into, into, into kind of lonely places and sitting there and thinking about reality. Very young, but showing tremendous maturity. Started to think of higher things. Worldly things would no longer attract him. 
would no longer attract him. When they were said, learn this subject, learn the grammar so you can become a teacher, learn all the ritual practices so you can then become a, even a pujari and do all these things and earn a living. He said, to eat a little bit of rice and dal or something, do I need to spend my whole life just to survive like an animal? I wish to learn that, I wish to get that education which resolves the issues of humanity. I wish to touch high, high, I want the highest education. I will not make do with the lower one. He had great difficulty because now you see his mind had turned to higher things. And you see he already holds a jackpot in his pocket without realizing what's hit him. He has already hit the, hit the high note. He continues in that particular mode, continues to go to his school and so on. And there's another incident. And there's another incident in his life which is very special because it throws light on how easy it is for this boy to become one-pointed. At a drop of a hat, he becomes very one-pointed. I'll just give an example. When he's about 10 years old, in the little village, they were going to perform on a Shivaratri night, they were going to perform a play on Shiva. So they'd got all the little boys and girls and little actors to play the parts of various deities and somebody to play the part of Shiva. Standard stuff in a little village. How do they celebrate? Gods and goddesses. So the play was going to be performed. And then just on the night of the, that particular day, Shivaratri, the actor was supposed to play the part of Shiva, had rumbling in his tummy. <laughs> so he had to be, because he, suddenly you can't have Shiva running to the loo, you know, suddenly. <laughs> so they excused him. They said, we'll leave you out. You, you know, you somebody was, so they said, they look around. Who will play the part of Shiva? And they, they looked at this little boy called Gadadhar, said, Gadadhar, you play? He said, no, 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 I want to play, said, you know, pray Shiva night. I don't want to do plays. I'll just pray. No, 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 you play the part of Shiva, they said. He said, all right, let's do the part of Shiva. Last person who should have been, you know, asked to do the performance was this poor chap. And he was, you know, they decided on him. So this gather was dressed up, you know, with whatever poor villagers could, you know, kind of uniform or, you know, clothing they could find to depict Shiva. They dressed him up. He was just 10 year old chap. And now he says, with the drum beating, Shiva entering the stage, you know. So this poor boy was led down to the stage. He came with his trishur and little kind of something curled around his round neck, he's supposed to be a snake, <laughs> and he walked in. But this little boy, you see, you should not, because without prompting, he was hitting the high notes. Now he's being prompted by the public to play the part of Shiva. That's the last thing you do to this boy. And he was asked to come on the stage. He came with his little trishul, you know, this trident, dressed up. He came in the middle of the stage. He looked at everybody. His eyes started to water, you know, Tears of joy flowing. And again, I tell the youngsters, you know, because children like to distinguish between tears of joy and tears of pain. And this is something very technical. It's good to tell. The tears of pain come closer to the nose. They flow this way. So when you smack somebody or you get smacked, you know where they come, the tears come from. <laughs> the tears of joy come from the outer edges. Somehow there is some technical reason for it. And this boy was standing in the pose of Shiva, posture of Shiva. And tears of joy were flowing like torrent on, down his eyes. And the audience was stuck, dumb stuck. So what to do? The play came to a halt. Because how can you do a play with a Shiva standing like this with the tears of joy coming down? <laughs> and this is a true story. He was like that continuously throughout. <laughs> so the play came to immediate halt because Shiva was not playing his part anymore. So the play came to a halt and he had to be carried away because he was like that. <laughs> he had to be carried away. And the Shiva role did not finish till the, for another 24 hours. He was like that. He couldn't get out. Why? Why? Let me tell you why. You see, when you are one-pointed and you're already prepared, you already come, the ground is prepared. You are not doing sadhana to achieve some end. You are already jnana siddha. You are already established in the highest level of meditation. It's just that nobody has prodded you to show your colors. So when they prod you by you know, making you wear Shiva costume, then they're asking for trouble. Once you prick, prick that outer layer, the reality flows out. So that boy was in the mood of Shiva, instantaneously being able to transform himself and become one-pointed on the principle of Shiva and lose his individuality. You see, we struggle to lose our individuality. We are stuck. We are shackled by our individuality. And we think we, we, we kind of embrace it, think, ah, that's me, that's me, what me? That's a nuisance. But this boy, when you prick that individuality, suddenly bursts forth and shows nothing but the spirit. 
So this Shiva play came to an end and the boy showed his colors and the parents were worried. Look, these are people in the villages. They thought something is wrong with the boy. We need to get him, a, you know, some vaid, some medicine man to sort him out or some, you know, booth breath has, you know, entered the boy, you know, some ghost has entered the youngster, so let's sort him out. They did all these things and the boy was perfectly normal in every sense. Of course, this is the story that carries further. Now this boy is there, again he's spending more and more time in the cremation ground. Now if a boy starts spending time in cremation, he's very morbid with worrying. You have to be worried, you have to be worried, I'm telling you. It's alright for Ramakrishna, but for us it's very worrying. <laughs> you have to be you know, check, taken to the psych psychiatrist. But this boy started spending time in a mood of renunciation. From a very young age, beginning to show his, his, his tendencies, his, if you like, his attraction to nothing but the highest. Anything less will not do for him. The story continues. While this was happening, he had an older brother called Ram Kumar, who had moved to Calcutta and was running a little, you know, like a school, teaching children, giving private tuition in grammar and, and language and other stuff, ritual practices. So he was earning, eking out a living that would just make the, enough money for the family to survive. But he was struggling, the poor man was struggling in Calcutta. Now, let me open another chapter of the story that was unfolding in Calcutta. The stage, you see this little boy had a little stage in the little village and played the part of Shiva and maybe 50, 100 villagers saw what weird thing he was doing. But surely this boy has come to play a part on a bigger stage, on an international stage. So the village had to be, the big, a bigger stage had to be created for him. And the story is unfolding now in Calcutta. In Calcutta lived a very rich widow, very rich widow, a very powerful personality called, called Rani Rasamani. She was a dynamo. She was considered to be one of the most kind of powerful personalities of Calcutta, a woman, a widow. A real powerful, a real kind of battle axe. Battle axe is the right word. Just to give an example of this Rani Rasmani and her power, very rich, because her husband has left a huge amount of kind of uh, uh, property for her, lots of land all over Calcutta, very rich and very headstrong. Just to give an example, when some, in one of her land, in pieces of land, some people were doing a performance and, you know, for a particular religious festival, they were playing musical instruments and they were kind of British soldiers in the regiment living nearby who complained, this is noisy for us. But they said, this is India, this is Indian festival we are celebrating and playing instruments and they complained. So the Rani, Rani Rasmani said, bring on more musicians, play louder. She was like, she was like headstrong like that. Bring more musicians. This is our country and this is our religious festival. Play more loudly. She was, it was capable of all that. They're very headstrong. So they brought more musicians and played even louder that night. And those people complained even more. And it's British rule. They said, we will fine the Rani Rasmani. We'll take her to court and fine her for nuisance. They took her to court and find her 50 rupees. This is a real story. I told you this is a new unusual katha. Mm -hmm. They find her 50 rupees. And Rani Rasmi, I sold you out. Now the soldiers had to pass through the land that belonged to her. Next day she put up barriers. <laughs> <laughs> so the British Empire will come to an end. They can't go through me because this is my land. They want to take me to court, I will take them to pieces now. They had to beg for forgiveness and say, let our soldiers come through and come out and come in. She was able to stop the empire. This woman was very headstrong, very powerful, unusual. You see, we need, you see, whenever a great personality comes, he comes with helpers around him. And she was one of the helpers being prepared to build the stage on which Ram Krishna could do his performance. And the stage was being set. This Rani, because she's very powerful, a major kind of you know, developer in that part of the world, when she said, I want to go on a pilgrimage, she would spend hundreds of thousands of rupees just for a pilgrimage. Hundreds of thousands of rupees on those, in those days is a huge amount, few lakhs of rupees. She said, I am going in a pilgrimage to Kashi now. Let's go. So there'll be a whole train will be hired for her and she'll be off. So all this thing was being prepared. Just on the night she was going to go begin her, her, her pilgrimage. This is the magical part of the story. He wants a bit of color. I told you, I warned you. I'll be very careful not to exaggerate. So the Rani, this is her own, this is her account. On the night she was just going to start her journey, she had a vivid dream. 
And in the dream, she saw the mother goddess appear. Now again, let me tell you about dreams. Most of the dreams we have are such nonsense, they kind of, kind of rattle, you know, we kind of rattle things together and they come up in kind of weirdness. Sometimes, once in a while, all of would have experienced certain dreams which appear to be more real than reality itself. Because we wake up feeling completely charged up or un, un, feel, feel thoroughly excited. We feel this is more than dream. This is the kind of dream I'm talking about. So in that dream, which appears more real than reality, she sees the mother goddess. And the mother goddess says, look, my daughter, forget about going to, you know, Kashi and worshipping Annapurna there. You know, the mother goddess, Parvati. Forget about that. Do you know what I want you to do? Spend this money in order to invoke me, the mother of the universe, will come on the banks of the Ganga and take your, accept your offerings. Prepare a, prepare a land, prepare land and install me on the bank of the river Ganga and I will become manifested there. I will appear there. You see, most of the temples are built, we put deities there, the deities stay deities and we think they are alive and we keep praying, good for us. But here is the mother goddess saying, install me, I will come alive, my, my daughter, install me. And this Rani was thrilled. You see, when you get a dream of that nature, you know this is real. If the dream was kind of just an ordinary dream, she would have just brushed it aside. But when you get a dream of this nature, you can't push it aside. You are hooked on it. So this Rani woke up and said, cancel the pilgrimage, look for land. And because there was a lot of jealousy and this Rani was from a lower caste, people would not give her land, even though she had all the money. On the bank of the river Ganga, it's difficult to find land. And she found some derelict land, which was uh, kind of uh, some officer's land, some Englishmen used to live there. And there was a, a cemetery with Muslim kind of graves there. She said, no problem, Mother Goddess doesn't mind. We'll go for that land. She picked up that land on the bank of the river Ganga. The river Ganga is on the, this land is on the east side of the river Ganga, flowing down into the sea. Four miles north of Calcutta is the little land she purchased. It's called Dakshineshwar. She was very rich. She had lots of money. So I think in those days she spent about 900,000 rupees to build a temple there on the banks of the river Ganga. She hired the best architects, the best planners, the best masons, and a temple started being built in 1844. The groundwork was being set, the stage was being prepared, you know, properly prepared for this personality to come and do his real play. The stage was being prepared. So here was in Dakshineshwar, we see a Kali temple built. The Kali temple is still there, you can visit it, most people do. <coughs> I think Krishna Bhai must have been there last week, last month. The Kali temple, the Kali temple has got, of course, the, the central deity is Kali. Now people shudder. You see, in fact, there's a primary school book which says, Hindus worship this bloodthirsty goddess called Kali. So, well, well, this is what Ramakrishna was pre being prepared for. So Kali temple is built. The central deity is Kali, carved out of black stone. The same image is still there, carved out of black stone. She is not just... She is, if you like, the idea of Mother Goddess in all its potency. And she doesn't cut any, you know, cu cut any corners. She is very blunt and basic. That's why shown in black, the mother of the universe, the creator and the all destroyer, the Bhavatarini being shown there, being prepared. So there's a Kali temple. And the Rani was very comprehensive. She was a pluralist, you can see. Just in the same ground, she has got Radha Krishna temple, so you got the Vaishnavite tradition. Does she stop there? No. She has built 12 Shiva temples, six on either side. So 12 Shiva temples, one temple devoted to Radha and Krishna, and one temple, the central temple devoted to Kali, sits on the bank of the river Ganga. And the groundwork was being prepared for this little boy to come and do his play. This is the story unfolding on the banks of the river Ganga. Now Ram Kumar, the elder brother of Ramakrishna, had to come to Calcutta to earn a living. And he was struggling to make ends meet. He thought, if I can bring my brother over, perhaps I can increase my income. He was struggling to pay the bills. He was getting into debt. He said, let me bring my younger brother Ramakrishna from Kamarpukur into Calcutta so he can become a help for me. Very practical idea. So he invited, took Ramakrishna with him to Calcutta. And Ramakrishna, little boy, said, yes, brother, I will come, whatever I can do. 
And he said, okay, try and teach. He said, that's not my business. He was like that. You see, again, this renunciation is something that is central. Without that strong renunciation, a strong idea that I want my priorities to be right, spirituality can never flourish. Mm -hmm. Examine our own lives. Because we, our priorities are always more materially oriented, we are not able to make much progress spiritually. If we get our priorities right, and spirituality that is the top end, we will start making very fast progress. So here is this, uh, you know, um, um, Ramakrishna saying, no, I'm not going to earn, go learn or teach, or make little money to just survive. My aim is for the higher things. The very high-flying, idealistic boy, how does he, how does, how does this story progress? So he's 17 year old, wrote to Calcutta, he's still a bit aloof, but for whatever reasons, I tell you how he got involved. One day, again, you see a unique feature about special personalities of the Hindu tradition is this, please watch out. Whenever you have a kind of a major personality, a real giant showing his colors, he will be able to show, give you a lateral, explain, a lateral understanding of your religion. He will not use the same format used by the previous ones. He will show a continuity with the previous teachings and yet he will come out with novelty and novel approach. This is a unique feature, watch out. Whenever you find any guru, any swami, any teacher, any proponent of Hinduism who falls back just on the old literature and then interprets and reinterprets, he is showing his limitation. The real giants produce new material, the stuff that comes out of their mouth is the modern new vision of spirituality, lateral, different, dynamic and unusual. And this was becoming, I'll just show you the example. So this Ram Krishna was playing around, staying with his brother, you know, just staying with him and not doing much really. During that period, one of the pujaris, priest, who was looking after the Radha Krishna temple, took out the image of Krishna and on that day he was supposed to go for a little trip, you know, Krishna goes around, you know, on certain days they take him out on a little wagon and, you know, take him for a tour. So they were taking him out, you know, Jagannath Puri kind of Yatra time. So he was, they were taking him out, the poor man was taking out, the priest was, and the floors were a bit slippery and he slipped and the murti of Krishna fell on the floor and the leg broke apart. Now I just show you the level of superstition and if you like the kind of, kind of un, lower understanding of religion. As soon as that happened, there was tremendous, you know, bustle and hustle in the temple saying, everybody was saying, oh dear, what's happened? A serious calamity is going to descend on the temple on Rani Rasmani. The image of Krishna broken, the leg broken, this is a signal of calamity to, arrive, to, 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 to approach the, the life of, uh, uh, you know, Rani Rasmani. This is terrible, everybody is worried. Rani Rasmani is worried, what will happen to me? See the level of superstition. They are, oh yes, the Shastra, they immediately pull out the Shastras. And this is visible in modern times. If we discover they fall back on Shastras, you know, or cremation or whatever, they pull out the Shastras. They say, oh, leg broken, very inauspicious sign. The Shastra says, you are in trouble, your whole generation will be wiped out. You know, this is written here. So they'll find, they'll find some text like that. They discover that, oh, this is terrible. And Rani, Rani Rasmani collect all the pandits, come sit together, advise me, what should I do, what should I, this has happened. They said, Rani, this is sad, but this only way what you can do is do resurgence of this particular image, means immerse it in water and get another new one made and again prana pratishta, make that image come alive and install it, reinstall another image in place of this Krishna. And they were arguing and fighting all the pandits and this is the only advice given to her. This is the only way you go forward, otherwise calamity. And while this was happening, this Ramakrishna, this little boy was listening. And he said, look, can I just ask, because this Rani Rasmani had four daughters. She had no sons, four daughters, and all the four, the, the daughters had, of course, husbands, son-in-laws. So now this is the example, you see, this is the, the kind of modern interpretations. He went and said, look, if Rani Rasmani's Jamai, you know, son-in-law, broke his leg, would he replace the Jamai? <laughs> 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 you see how blunt and honest it is, you know? and immediately it catches your attention. Yeah, you know, you don't replace yours because your leg is broken. This is not acceptable. You know, this is what a silly thing to say that you replace. You know, because the leg is this is terrible. The moment he said, everybody said, yeah, this sounds very. You see, this is the this is what I mean by lateral, lateral interpretation, very honest, and shows his uniqueness 
unless a personality shows the uniqueness in interpreting religion, don't believe them. He must be unique. Every situation that he faces, he will come up with a unique reply. He will never give the standard stuff or, or fall back on the scripture saying, oh, let me look in page number this. And there are different pages with different instructions. You know that. You get lost in that. It's all jargon there. And you get completely lost in the jargon and you say, where are we? Where are we? And they can, this is how the Hindu tradition carries on. Just kind of getting lost in the jargon. And here is this man giving a very lateral explanation. Rani Rasmani Jamai, because Rani Rasmani Jamai was running the temple. He was telling, do, would you replace him if he fell down? <laughs> and they said, no, we repair it. So he said, all right. They took his advice. A seven-year-old boy gave this advice. And the pandits were saying, ah, we, we haven't seen that anywhere in the scriptures. He said, repair. Repair the image and put it back. They said, we'll repair. And I told you this boy had many, many kind of artistic qualities. And in the village, he picked up one art, which was to make images. He could make excellent images himself. He was no good in time stable. Was very good at making images. And Sita is smiling. Yeah, good stuff. That's what I like. <laughs> so they, they could make images. And he, he said, give it to me. And he repaired that image of Krishna. It is still in the Dakshineshwar temple. And you can't see the joint where it has been repaired. He done a marvelous job. So you see the leg is properly set and the son-in-law is safe. <laughs> 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 so he is working properly. And that Krishna Murti is still there in the, in the Dakshineshwar temple. The one that this, this Ramakrishna repaired. The story continues. Now you see this Rani Rasmani and this this son-in-law, let me mention the son-in-law, because he's one of the characters. You see, the important thing about this story about Ramakrishna, Katha of Ramakrishna is, I'm not just presenting one personality, I'm showing you how this personality relates to various other people who come in his life, and how he influences all of them, how he manages to turn them, how he manages to wind them up, how he manages to lift them up. And you see, when we look at all this personality, we will immediately like the, you know, like the soap opera, we'll start attaching ourselves to certain person. This sounds like me. We'll begin to relate to certain personalities in a very personal manner. This is the whole idea of a katha. You see, when you are children, you do the katha of uh, in Ramayana, most children immediately relate to the idea of character of Hanuman. They say, that's me. And uh, Hanuman's ups and downs are their ups and downs. They go with it. They flow with it. In the same way, when we do this modern Katha, you'll find various characters appearing, like, like Rani Rasmani, a real battle axe fighter. And you find various other characters appearing as the Katha goes on. And all of them very interesting, all unusual, all different. And you see how this, this, this wonderful personality called Ramakrishna interacts with all of them and how he lifts them all up in an unusual manner. All different, different. Again, a feature of, of, of a super personality is this. When he gives a message or tries to interact with any individual, he will do it in a very individual manner. He won't just give one prescription that fits all requirements. He will never do that. Depending on who he's dealing with, his prescription will be just focused for that person. This is the unique feat. They know what to do. They are masters. So they will give different prescriptions to different personalities that they interact with. With some they smile, with some they tell them off. Same person, different messages. Again, show the versatility of a spiritual personality. They're not set in a rut, not stuck. They give a, 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 a prescription that suits the need of that particular patient. Now, if you went to a doctor in life, suppose you went to Dr. Kaka, and suppose you just give the same prescription to every patient who comes, I think 99 of them would die. <laughs> and, and one person would survive, you know, there are the fits, some of fits. So you never give the same prescription to different patients. You give them different prescriptions to, you know, rid them of the illness or sickness of this, this worldly life that we lead to relieve them of the pain that we suffer in our routine life. So you have different prescriptions and this Ramakrishna is master. That's why you'll see him interacting differently and you'll see how he interacts with Rani Rasmani in a minute too. So this story goes on and now we bring in a new personality, the son-in-law of Rani Rasmani who is in charge of running the temple because she had only son-in-laws. So she had no sons and they were running the whole, whole show. They have huge kind of major corporation they were running in Calcutta. Very powerful personalities. I mean, of equal stature to Devendra Tagore, you know, equal stature, they were on the, that level. So here is, now I'm introducing this other gentleman called Mathur Babu, Rani Rasmani's son-in-law. Unique personality, unusual personality, but very sharp. He kept watching this Ramakrishna and said, this boy is special. The way he looks at them, you know, he's doing various things and the way he kind of decided to repair the image shows he's very unusual. 
and he would observe him on the banks of the river Ganga sitting sometimes meditating, making images from sand of certain gods and goddesses and sitting in front of him meditating. He would watch and say, unusual boy, I wish I could somehow employ him. So they tried to say, would you like to work, assist, you know, with these ornaments or something? He said, no, go away. He would run away. He would, he would just reject. He wouldn't accept uh, employment. He wasn't bothered. And that made him, made Mathur Babu even more keen to employ him. He said, this is the right fellow. He doesn't want money. Something more special is becoming, becoming visible in his life. I want him strongly involved in my temple. So he was after him all the time. While this was happening, again, another kind of, kind of mishap in the life of Ramakrishna. His elder brother, Ramakumar, at a very young age, died suddenly. And he was one of the priests in the temple. Now he's gone. So it became essential for them to find a replacement. At this stage, they decided to catch hold of this Ramakrishna. Look, we are struggling. Become a helper to the priest or do something for us. We are struggling with manpower here. Please assist. And this boy somehow casually agreed. But now the role, the story goes into a different phase. Because this Ramakrishna is asked to worship and his way of worship is very unusual. It's not normal in any sense. See the difference between a real devotee and a make-believe, which feel like a superficial devotee. Here is a real devotee. When he's looking at the image of Mother Goddess, he, go, he's, he becomes very, you know, enlivened. He's somehow not satisfied to see a deity in the form of a piece of stone that he keeps worshipping. So he keeps looking at her and says, Oh mother, are you for real or just made of stone? A real devotion begins to pour out from his heart. He is no longer satisfied. You see, with us, we go to a temple, we look at the deity, we bow down, we offer coconut and we come home. We are satisfied. This boy is not, this young man is not satisfied. He says, Oh mother, are you for real? If you are for real, why can't I see you? Show yourself to me, O oh mother. And the way he was worshipping, for so example, some artist, he would be, it would be going on for, for hours because he keeps imploring her. and doesn't follow the ritual, the, the timing of the temple. So it kind of things get dragged. And the people in the temple get worried and say, Mathur Babu, look at this, he's, he's an idiot. Throw him out, he's a madman. The way he's worshipping is not according to the Shastras. Is you know abandoning everything in the shastra and doing what he likes and worshiping in a unique manner, unusual manner, not prescribed in any shastras. You must kick him out. He's a madcap. And Madhubha said, I'll test him out. One day he came quietly and watched this Ramakrishna imploring the mother goddess. He was in hiding, he didn't want to show himself. And the way with the devotion with which this boy was imploring the mother goddess, I tell you, stone would melt. Forget about Madhur Babu's heart, it would melt. You could see the genuine devotion pouring out of this young boy, young man. And Mathur Babi said, look, if anybody gets in the way of this boy, I will take him to task. Leave him alone. Let him worship the way he likes. Do you know why? He said, he is going to make sure the mother goddess becomes manifested in this temple. And the purpose for, for which this temple was built will be fulfilled by this young boy. He could see that boy. See the power of that boy. An ordinary, you know, employer would have kicked him out. He said, no, no, this is special boy. I recognize him. Leave him alone. Let him be. So this boy starts to worship the mother goddess, imploring her. Now, you see, you think that this person who has had this Brahma Gnan, why is he taking on this particular role of imploring the mother goddess and looking for God with form to come in front of him? There's a reason behind it. You see, what we discover in the story of this Ramakrishna is this. This is some of the astute thinkers have said about Ramakrishna. This is, becomes visible in this story. As, I said, as the story unfolds, you see the depth of the story. They say, in the life of this one human being, this Ramakrishna, we see, if you like, the, the, the aspirations of millions of Hindus for thousands of years coming together. You see? The Hindus have implored this idea, have, have, have employed this idea of God with form, God is a personality to play with, interact, actually experience firsthand. They've invoked this idea. And this idea had been very visible. And here in this one life, you're going to see a reconciliation of a variety of different spiritual approaches reconciled in one human life. One human life. 
this is the comprehensive ideas that become visible in the story of Ramakrishna. Spirituality not explored in a, just a, if you like a narrow manner, but in the most widest manner possible. That is why he was getting this mother goddess to come and play with him. He said, come, O mother, if you are for real, show yourself to me, O mother. Now the story star continues. This bow in the afternoon is not easily visible in the temple. He seems to disappear somewhere, goes in some lonely place. At night he does even worse things. At night, there is a temple in the north part of Dakshineshwar. Was a very, they're not temple, there's a forest area in the north part of Dakshineshwar temple, forest. Very deep forest in those times. People would not normally get in the forest. At night, this boy, this young man, started to disappear into the forest. Now, he had one nephew who was looking after him and calling him Mama. This Baniyo was very special. And his name is Radai. He's another character that's going to enter the story of Ramakrishna. So, this Radai was looking after Ramakrishna and Ramakrishna was doing this weird thing. He said, Mama, this is not good. They'll throw both of us out of the temple. Behave yourself. And Mama said, look, my boy, let me do what I like. And this was the kind of relation between Mama and Banesh. They were going on quite well. And Radai suddenly saw that at night this Mama disappears into the forest. What is he up to? So one night he decided to follow him. But he's a bit frightened of going in the deep forest. Because he said, why? It was built on a place cemetery. Cemetery, so ghosts. They're worried about not animals, but ghosts, you know, wandering around in the forest, going a yuppie and having party. So this, <laughs> this Radai was a bit nervous about following the Mama into the forest. But he said, let me do something, let me see. Now you, see, you can see the naive story. So this Radai looked around, he saw some stones. He picked up some stones and when he saw Mama disappearing into the bushes, he picked up the stones and threw in that direction. So it'll make a crash sound. He thought the Mama will come and run, run away saying, ah, ghost and come out, come back. He was trying to frighten his Mama to come back, so he could leave the forest. And no Mama came back. So he said, let me go. I'll be adventurous. I'll go follow him. He went there and he saw this Ramakrishna sitting under a tree. You see, he had already, he was a, a Brahmin boy. He was wearing a Janoi. He had taken the Janoi away. He taken, he used to wear a very simple, literally one piece of white cloth all his life. This one. He had discarded the piece of cloth, no cloth. So this is kind of no janoi, no cloth, just sitting, deep meditation under a tree. He was, this, is, this is unusual. And you sit in meditation, why do you throw your clothes off? This is a bit too much, too weird. And that this brother was thinking, Mama is becoming possessed by some ghost or something, doing weird things, throwing his Janoi away. That is like discarding your religion. This is terrible. This What is he up to? Doing weird things here. So, brother went, said, Mama, Mama, what are you doing? And Ram was deep in meditation. But after some time, he came off to meditation. He said, Mama, what are you doing? And the reply we get is a prescription that fits all of us. He said, listen, my boy. If you wish to experience spirituality, you need not to discard. You know what I'm doing? I'm discarding the externals. Look, in, on his body, you will never find any ornament. No janoi, nothing. One piece of white cloth, and even that used to fall away from time to time. And we had to run, some of his disciples had to run and tidy, tight down tightly. You know, because it's a matter of seeing. Let me tell you another story that, that kind of fits in this thing. When he became a little bit more famous later on, they went to Tagore, wanted to talk to him, a very famous personality, Ravindranath Tagore's father, and they had a nice conversation about spirituality. And Ramakrishna was like, he would go, he went to visit Devendranath Tagore. This is the unique feature of this personality. He would go out and visit anybody he felt was kind of rattling with spirituality. He wanted to interact with them. They didn't come looking, he went looking for them. Very special. You won't get somebody like him. So he used to, he went to see Devendra Tagore, they had a nice conversation. He was very saying, wow, this Devendra is a lovely person, trying to be like a King Janak, living in the worldly life and still being spiritual. Marvelous, he came away. While they were talking, Devendra Tagore said, hmm, you are such a lovely person. Look, he is giving, you know, um, credential to Ramakrishna. He said, you know, you are such a lovely person. You got a special function with all the dignitaries coming next week, and I would like to invite you. But, please, please, Wear better clothes, <laughs> cover the top and the bottom, there will be ladies present, don't come like that. And this Ramakrishna, guileless chap, you know, he didn't think they could take it serious. He said, oh well, you know, I can't be a dandy like you, he said. <laughs> I'll come like this. <laughs> I can't just turn a dandy because you want me to turn a dandy. And Devan Rakhva, don't worry, come. 
But look at the story. This is an unusual story. Next day, Devendranath Tagore wrote to Mathur Das, Mathur Babu, don't bring him, don't bring him, because I can't trust him, he's going to come like that. <laughs> now let me show you. You see, human beings look at the external and forget to look at the real stuff. Here is almost a God-man coming to his door, trying to come into his home. And for the sake of these externals, he set him, set him, sent him away. Who's bad luck? Who's bad luck? Just think about that. But let me continue with the story. So, Mama, Mama, what are you doing? And Ramakrishna says something that touches me. In fact, that touched me. This is when I did the story, read the story of Sri Ramakrishna for the first time from this little booklet when I was 17 year old too. When I came to that part, I shuddered. I shuddered. He said, my boy, if you want to drink from the fountain of spirituality, discard the externals. You know what the externals are? Bhaya, Lajja, Gruna. We are in, you know, we are in, you know, if you like, in, you know, we can't, they are incorporated in our system. Suppose somebody does clap, you all go like that. Bhaya is inbuilt in us. Lajja, Gruna, aversion, kind of shyness, bodiness, this body, if you like, this, this oneness with the body. It is embedded in our structure. We need to break free from the shackles. These shackles that limit us and do not allow us to see it, get a deeper vision into reality. We must discard this if you wish to touch base with our spiritual being. That is why I am discarding all the externals. I have no lajja, no grana, nothing. I am in search of God. And the boy said, Mama, don't tell everybody, you know, because this is unusual, you know, discarding the Jano is considered to be sacrilegious. You're not supposed to discard your Jano, you know, this is terrible. But this Mama was unusual, the character was unusual. And the unique feature about this personality is his ordinariness. That's why there are no people beating drums at his door, no major cult or a sectarian movement springing up in his, in his name. This is a good sign, because if you like, this shows that as, as the world evolves, as humanity evolves, the way they will relate to the idea of spirituality cannot necessarily be cultish or narrow. It has to be very broad. It should relate to the ordinary. That's why the life of this person is very ordinary. I mean, I, I've deliberately cut out any magical stuff. I kept it to the minimum so that it appears as ordinary as possible. Because there is the aim of this particular personality. This is the fountainhead of spirituality, this Sri Ramakrishna. People have not even heard the name, but I'm taking the gamble of dishing him out into greater society. So, so be it. In fact, in fact, when I'm challenged, sometimes I'm challenged quite often because I interact with the Hindus all the time. I'm challenged, Mr. Lakhani, what is your authority? Did you go to, you know, Banaras Hindu University to study Hinduism? Have you studied the scriptures, the, you know, this and that? I say, oh, leave me alone. <laughs> I don't know any of that. I only know my mentor and the name of my mentor is called Swami Vivekananda. And you Hindus voted him at the end of last century as the spiritual light of India in the last century. So that's my, it's the, it's the general vote of confidence in Swami Vivekananda that I rely on. That is my authority and inspiration. And then you see, if you talk to Vivekananda and say, what is your source of authority? This Vivekananda says, look, leave me out. Everything that I've acquired, and these, are the, these are his words, lovely stuff. He was very, very truthful, even being modest. He said, look, if there's anything good I've said or good any, anything good I've done, know for certain it was inspired by my master called Ramakrishna. And all the mistakes were my, 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 my production. See, this was not just being modest. He was aware that he's working also under the shadow of a spiritual giant, this Ramakrishna who is almost an unknown personality. So, when anybody attacks me, I pass the buck to Vivekanand. When anybody kind of attacks Vivekanand, he passes the buck on to Sri Ramakrishna. This is called passing the buck in English. <laughs> and why are we comfortable with that? Because we know we are dealing with a super personality, a giant, who appears very ordinary, very simple, very humble. So, we have started the story of Sri Ramakrishna. In the first part, we say, here is a young man, about 18 keen not to just believe in the idea of spirit, religion, mother goddess, but actually coming face to face with it. 
see a unique feature of our religion. It has never been a belief system. It always says it has to be experiential. And this becomes visible with this young man imploring the mother of the universe, saying, Oh, mother, are you for real or make-believe? Are you just this stone image that I am worshipping? Oh, mother, if you are for real, why don't you show yourself to me? I have heard historic accounts of other people seeing the mother goddess. Why can't I? Am I that bad? Why don't you appear in front of me, oh, mother? And this man now works very hard. All day, he's just thinking of the mother goddess, imploring her. At night, he disappears into the forest. All night, he sits under a tree and meditates and focuses on the idea of the, 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 the great creator, the mother of the universe. And he wants her to become visible. This went on. This is very long. You see, he had this higher spiritual experience without any prompting at the age of seven. He just hit it out, hit on it straight away. And now, he's 18, and he wants to be the mother of the universe. He's taking his time. <coughs> the story says, for six years, he used to cry, implore the mother of the universe, saying, Oh, mother, show yourself to me if you are for real. Otherwise, how can I believe you? Mother, show yourself. He used to rub his face on the ground and cry, Oh, mother, oh, mother. And the pastors by standard stuff look at him and say, oh, maybe his mother is in the village, he's missing his mummy. But he's looking for the mother of the universe, not his mummy in Kamar Bukur. <laughs> they can't, people cannot make the difference. And say, oh, yes, well, maybe this mum, the fellow loves his mother's boy, you know, he wants his mummy. Fair enough. And the story goes on. For six years, he's imploring, his eyes are red at, because he doesn't sleep at night. And all day, he's just thinking of nothing but the mother goddess. Nothing but mother goddess, day and night. Six years passed like that. The story continues. One day, this Ramakrishna, in the, in the temple of Mother Goddess, looked at the image of Mother Goddess and said, Oh, Mother, I've had enough. I told you, strong-willed. I had enough. Today, either you show yourself to me or I kill myself. Now, whenever we've done this story, you know, through plays that we've done many times in the past, we always told the audience, this part of the story comes with a health warning. Don't do what Ramakrishna did next, otherwise we'll all be you know, visiting you in the hospital. Don't do it. We strictly say, Ramakrishna can do it, you can't do it, leave it alone. So this Ramakrishna, when he came to the end of his tether, he looked at the image of Mother Goddess, oh, Mother, show yourself to me, and he looked around. In the temple of Kali temple, they put, the, if you like, some of the, the weapons of the Mother Goddess on the walls as, as, as decoration. And there is, a, there is a nice kind of sword of the Mother Kali on the temple wall of Dakshineshwar. And this young man had enough. After so many years, this is getting too much. He jumped up like a madman. He was almost there like a madman anyway. He jumped up, picked up the sword, and was about to really slow, you know, chop his head off. That's why I said this part comes with health warning. Don't attempt it at home. <laughs> he picked up the sword, about to chop his head off. Real story in real times, in our times. And then in his own world, because he was very candid, he would talk frankly about his spiritual experience with his disciples. It's well recorded, so it's no supposition. This is his experience in his own words. And when I hear this experience, it gives me a thrill. Because this is what it should be. This is what it should be. It can't be anything less. He said in my own words, in his own words, he said, when I was about to bring this life to an end, because I had enough, and I was about to do that, suddenly, he said, the, the floor on which I was standing, the walls of the temple which I could see all around me, the image of the Mother Goddess, everything began to disappear, disintegrate, disappeared. Look, if you stand on the floor and suddenly if you look down, there's no floor, it will be very worrying. Everything disappeared. But the good part is, you too disappear. You can't see your body either. <laughs> in this state, he says, I saw. Look at the language of spirituality in our times, expressed by a person who is talking from experience, not some book learning, no scriptures, no, no shastras. He said, I saw huge waves roaring made of light. See, not some material being. Huge waves of light roaring and coming to me from all different directions. There is no temple, there is no wall, there is no body, but the waves are coming towards me, I see them roaring 
and overpowering me. And I fall down exhausted. These are the sweetest thing you can experience. These are the waves of spiritual experience kind of you know, rising through your body, your whole system. He said, I fell and there I see the blissful mother standing in front of me. And this state, and of course he fell down on the floor because the rest of people say, oh, the madman has fallen down now. Carry him into his room. So they picked him up, took him to his room. He stayed like this for three days in that blissful state, completely oblivious to the rest of the world, the physical world. And the only thing you could hear from his lips was, Mother, oh Mother, oh Mother. Look, spiritual experience has to be that dynamic, that heartfelt, that powerful, that overpowering. It cannot be anything less. When I read these experiences, I get a thrill. Look, this is inheritance that belongs to all of us. We all are destined for such powerful experiences where we lose this kind of idea of our limited being and experience ourselves in its true glory as a spiritual being. And here you see this kind of yum, this waves coming and overwhelming this Sri Ramakrishna. He's in sight, if you like, he's got first hand, he's, you know, if you like, face to face with the spirituality that he was conjuring up, developing. Mother Goddess comes in front of me. Sometimes we think, here is a Mother Goddess and his little son, little Bhakta called Ramakrishna. That's how they see him. He's the devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, Kali devotee of Dakshineshwar. Ah, I say, look, you missed the point. It is not that the Mother Goddess has conjured or produced this Ramakrishna. When I look at the depth of this personality, it is this Ramakrishna who has conjured up the Mother Goddess. Can you believe things like that? He is playing along as a devotee of the great Mother Goddess. The Mother Goddess has been produced from this being. He conjured her up. He was taking his time. This is the strength and the depth of this Ramakrishna. Few people would recognize. And he never made many fuss about it. But now a situation arises between the Mother Goddess and this Ramakrishna, which is highly unusual not seen in the history of mankind. You see, what happens in most cases is the great bhaktas have a fleeting glimpse of their ideal, the deity of their choice, Mira, Tukaram, Tulsi. They get a fleeting glimpse and they charge up the rest of their life. They are no longer the same. With this case of Sri Ramakrishna, this vision is permanent. This has not been, not been visible in the history of mankind. God and man interacting with each other throughout, continually, from now on until the end of his life. This first and spiritual experience, fully flowing, fully visible, fully intense, in one lifetime, throughout the rest of his life, this has not been recorded in the history of mankind. It is that dramatic, that dynamic. Now this young man is able to see the mother goddess, talk to him, play with him, and have great fun. Imagine being able to relate to personality, spirituality in this personalized manner, and interact with that personality. Great deal of fun and games kind of are, are now kind of the, the, the name of the game. Let me just also touch on some of the interesting things that are happening at the same time. Now this Ramakrishna's met method of worshipping has changed dramatically because he sees now, not that image, but he sees the real mother goddess. So when he goes for offering food, I'm telling you, he's going to break every Shastra, laws of Shastra. It is, he's a lot told you. You don't know what he's doing. He's manufacturing this himself. So now once in a while, you know, there's a little bed for the mother goddess to lie down for siesta. This Ram, you don't touch that, you know, this is a sacred thing, Mother Goddess. This Ramakrishna would go and lie down on it. No difficulty. And sometimes when he offers food to the Mother Goddess, he say, Oh Mother, do you want me to have it first? Don't worry, Mommy, here, I eat first and give it to you. He's giving her his prasad. People go, ah, you're not supposed to do stuff like that. It becomes like that and say, what is happening? What is happening? See, this is spirituality, real spirituality. It doesn't, doesn't wait for a kind of sanction from some scriptures. It produces new scriptures of modern spirituality unfolding on modern stage. He's interacting with the Mother Goddess in the most intimate, in the most personal manner, without any, any bother about what the scriptures might say or not say. 
Now the people in the temple got worried. They said, this is the, the temple is getting going down the tube now. The, the things are not happening. They should be happening. This guy is doing weird things in the temple. And the story went that everybody is worried and they told the temple authorities, this is a madman, he should be thrown out. But I told you this, Mathur Babu was able to see the depth of his personality. And it's a wonderful incident. You see, he, I told you, he keeps himself hidden as just a little devotee, wallowing, oh, mommy. There is much more to this Ramakrishna. In this particular period, for example, one day when he just walking up and down in front of his room, this Mathur Baba from his, house, from his room, he had his own room in the near the temple, was watching him. And this is Mathur Baba's you know, um, experience, again well recorded. He said, I saw this Ramakrishna move, go from one side of the, the porch to the other, started walking, and suddenly, with open eyes, I saw that's not Ramakrishna, that is Shiva. And then he would turn around and start walking the other way. And I would do this. I said, the mother goddess walking that way. She was changing colors. Mother goddess, Shiva, Shiva, mother goddess. And Mathuva said, something is wrong. You know, I've got some problem. So he started, you know, you know, wiping his eyes. said, something is gone wrong with my, you know, my, my eyesight. I'm seeing Shiva and mother goddess walking up and down. And they keep changing. He ran. The poor man ran. Fell at the feet of the Ramakrishna. and said, oh, father. He used to call him father. Oh, father. I know who you are. I know who you are. And this Ramakrishna said, well, I don't know what you are talking about. He said, but I see Shiva and Mother. He said, I don't know anything. This man said, I don't know anything. <laughs> and this is I, your devotee from that day. Tremendous devotion to this Ramakrishna. You see, you need that first hand glimpse into your personality to develop that relationship. Look, do you know why I'm waving my arms? It is the tremendous encounter of the such high personalities that it, it, it makes you animated, you know, we yeah, must do things. It is, if you like, glimpse of this deeper aspect of a personality that animates other human beings. So here we see this Mathur Babu. Let me do some of the extra stories with Mathur Babu, I think. One day Mathur Babu thought, look, he is such a lovely fellow, I must buy him some present. You know, understandable stuff, we all want to do stuff like that. So he bought the most expensive shawl. You know, there must be manufactured Banaras or something. Very expensive shawl, you know, maybe thousands of rupees on those, in those days. And he presented it to Ramakrishna. And Ramakrishna is like a child, like a child, guileless. And yet I told you, he's a, he's a, this guy is difficult to fathom. What Vivekan said is not under, under, understatement. I told you. So this Ramakrishna looked at the shawl and said, oh, he felt so nice. Somebody gave a little present to a little boy. He put it round his shoulder, said, yeah, look, look. He was feeling very nice. For a few minutes, this carried on. But you see the color of this gentleman showing up very quickly. And then suddenly, he became very disgusted. He said, this shawl, this, how can it possibly capture my attention? This thing is capturing my attention? This is terrible. He threw it the shawl on the, they're watching, they're watching him. Suppose you give a present to somebody. He wears it and goes, wow, wow. And then he throws it on the floor in front of you. Not a good thing to do. And then, did he, did he stop there? No. He started kicking it. Did he stop there? No. He started spitting on it. Now, if you give present to anybody, you start, they start doing that. You know, you must check out the mental home and see if it's... <laughs> he started spitting on it. Did he stop there? No. He was so annoyed. How dare this shawl capture my attention? He was so annoyed, he wanted to light a fire and burn it there. And they had to literally drag it away from me because he was after the shawl to burn it now. <laughs> they had to drag it away from him and save the shawl. I think maybe sitting in the, in the archives in, in Belurumat somewhere. They had to save the shawl because this guy was so annoyed with the shawl. How dare he? <laughs> Let me tell you a reason. During this period, the mother goddess was constant vision for this young man. And he said in one, one of his talks, he said, you know what happened? In the middle of night, one night, Suddenly I heard that Mother Goddess, I heard somebody there, so I opened my eyes and saw the Mother Goddess standing next to me. And she was holding a little basket. And she said, my boy, I brought this for you. Look at this kind of fun and games story between Mother Goddess and Ramakrishna. She said, I brought the basket for you, my boy. And Ramakrishna looked in the basket. He said, you know what was in the basket? Name, fame, wealth. Huh, I said, told the Mother Goddess, Mother, I don't own any of this. Keep it to yourself. Now, you see, you don't do that to Mother Goddess. He said, you can keep it. <laughs> I don't have no time for this stuff. You keep it, oh Mother. Now, you see, a person, I told you, this Ramakrishna is no ordinary person. 
to tell the mother goddess off. Don't try and give this nonsense to me. I am not interested in any of this. And he used to say, I spit on this mummy. I, this, this spitting was usual stuff for him. I spit on this. He said, I don't want any of this. He said, when I said that, the mother goddess smiled and disappeared. She was just messing around with him. <laughs> At this particular juncture, I told you about this, this, this battle axe called Rani Rasmani who owned the temple garden. Who owned the temple, who was a major, major player in, in, in the field of commerce in Calcutta. One day she was, you know, looking after a huge, you know, corporation. One day she came to the temple, of course it's her temple, she'll come and everybody will look after her and she can sit in front of the deity and worship and do the formal worship. And she came and she, Ramakrishna was singing this song to the mother goddess, look, anybody who heard this Ramakrishna sing, I told you he was no good in maths, but he was very good at singing. Anybody who heard him sing, you know, the, the, the hair on your body will stand up to attention because now you see you see spirituality flowing those words will raise you whoever you are whatever your background whatever your caliber he will give you your caliber he will lift you up rani rasmani who owned the temple garden who owned the temple who was a major major player in, in in the field of commerce in calcutta one day she was you know looking after a huge you know corporation one day she came to the temple, of course it's her temple, she'll come and everybody will look after her and she can sit in front of the deity and worship and do the formal worship. And she came and Sri Ramakrishna was singing this song to the mother goddess, look, anybody who heard this Ramakrishna sing, I told you he was no good in maths but he was very good at singing, anybody who heard him sing, you know, the, the, the hair on your body will stand up to attention because now you see you see spirituality flowing those words will raise you whoever you are whatever your background whatever your caliber he will give you your caliber he will lift you up so whenever he sung the atmosphere will get charged up around him throughout his life and he was singing lovely because for him the image is no longer an image it's a real living deity he was singing his heart out and the rani rasmani was there and while this was happening Mm, Rani Rasmani had a lot of court cases, you know, against her and she was fighting various court issues and so on. And suddenly this Ram Krishna stopped, went to Rani Rasmani and smacked her. <laughs> Gave her a real smack, real whack one, really heavy one, without any hesitation. Now, she is the owner of the temple where he is working as a priest. And you go and hit your employer, smack her straight in the face without any hesitation. Said, here too you are thinking about that court case? Don't focus on mother goddess, whack you, you know, smack you. He sm gave her a real smack. Now this Rani Rasmani was, you know, to, up to the task. Ordinary employer would have said, kick him out. She said, he knew I was thinking about the case. How did he know about that? that about the <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> she, she kept quiet. But the temple author got worked up. This is just getting out of hand. He's, he's going around smacking people. <laughs> this is getting completely out of hand. He's go, definitely gone mad. We need to do some, you know, some kind of uh, medication. He needs medication or something, treatment. This guy is not normal anymore. He's all right. He's devoted to Mother Goddess and he sings and all that. But something has gone seriously wrong. We need to bring him back to normal. Now, how do people become normal in normal terms? You see, if it's a man, a young man, what do you do? You find him a partner. <laughs> Make him normal. <laughs> you know, there's a story, you know, this one Lohana guy. You know, somebody told you, you know why, how he's able to control his children or youngsters? I say, how? He's, he no, learns the trick. As soon as his son is 18 or 19, he gets a woman, a wife for him and gets him married. And that boy will become his slave forever. Because now he's got his wife to look after, children already start pop, you know, pop, popping up and he towards guys of daddy, what should I do next? He will never do anything apart asking. For, so he's, this is how I control my boys. I get them married off early and then they're under my control because they've got children and wherever will they go? They sit at my feet and do this business and they do it. See, no one is good at this stuff. So this is how they control the children. <laughs> so here the Ramkar, this is not, is abnormal. How do we make him normal? Find, a, find him a a girl, a gender, then you see all this celibacy has gone to his head, made him abnormal. Let him make sure that he loses celibacy. This is a true story. 
So this Mathur Babu, because he was a worldly man, eh? he was a very worldly man, a dandy. Even though he's married to this Rani Rasmani's uh, daughter, he would visit the place of ill, ill repute without any hesitation. In those days, people, you know, rich people would visit the place of ill repute as if this is standard, you know, entertainment. So he knew all the places of ill repute, this Mathur Babu. So he said, we know what, put him in the carriage, this old man, this, this Ram Krishna, put him in the carriage. And this Radhe also came, you know, support. He said, my mama has gone mad, let's sort him out. <laughs> <laughs> so they both climbed up, they took him. They took him to a place of ill repute, you know, where this kind of prostitution area. And they took him there, and this Ramakrishna, like a young boy comes, a young man comes, yes, you know, wonder, wonder, looking everything. They took him, there's a, the name is recorded. And there was a, a courtesan, very courtesan, very famous in, in, in that time in Calcutta, very beautiful. And all the people would say, wow, this is the beauty. And they, the, her name is Lakshmi Bai, I checked it up. <laughs> they said, okay, we sit downstairs, send this man, young man, he's about 25, send him to Lakshmi Bai, she'll sort him out. <laughs> and they sent him to Lakshmi Bai, said, go in that room, go in that room. And yeah, this boy said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Guileless, completely, even that age, guileless. He walked into the room and Lakshmi was waiting for him, all kind of dressed up, you know, all makeup on, ready to entertain the client. And the, she had been told that Mathur Babu has sent this client, look after him well. And this Lakshmi is all ready. And this Ramakrishna walks in. This is an unusual story. He walks in, he sees the mother there, he says, Ah, blissful mother! <laughs> <laughs> you are here too, mommy! <laughs> <laughs> and you see, the moment he sees, this was this state of mind. Imagine if we wish we could ever acquire this state of mind. If he saw any woman, a prostitute, for him, that was the image of the mother of the universe. He could not see any woman as a woman anymore, but the image of the divine mother. Every woman was the divine mother. So he looked at this kind of well made up divine mother, says, she's done proper job now. I must bow down to her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, divine blissful mother, you are here too. And he went into deep in meditation. You see, this guy at the, at the snap of a finger could go into deepest of meditation. You see, he loses body consciousness, becomes still, and tremendous joy flows from within. This is called blissful meditation. Rio hits you straight away. And that Lakshmi said, Wow, what are these idiots trying to do to me? <laughs> They're sending a holy man like this. <laughs> and then I will have. You see, being a courtesan, being a prostitute is no problem for her. This is root in this business. But these guys are really putting her in the, in the depth of hell by sending this holy man here. <laughs> she became running down, saying, who are you? What, what are you trying to do to me? <laughs> don't you see? You? This is a, oh, you don't do that. <laughs> and this Mathu Babu and this Radhai said, okay, this man is difficult to kind of, you know, <laughs> to de de he won't deviate. <laughs> Take him home. <laughs> can wait. You see, it is nice to test. You see, whenever an issue arises and you test it and it passes the test, it gives you tremendous confidence. And this Mathur Babu and this Radha, could see this person was not mad in any sense. He was in a living in an exalted state, spiritually enlightened, fully awakened. And they could see that this trying to test was kind of testing them and not testing this person at all. You see, many a times he would be taken to a theater and all the actresses were considered to be fallen women in those times. If you are an actress in the, in, the, in, the, in the theater in Calcutta in that time, you were considered to be a fallen woman, like a prostitute. And they would come and they would touch his feet and people said, don't let touch your feet, they are impure people. And Sri Ramakrishna would go into meditation, oh mother, don't touch my feet please. And they would touch and they would feel blessed forever. He was, he was dishing out spirituality without any consideration of who came near him. There was no restriction. This is the modern spiritual giant of India. You know, happy to spread spirituality in any direction, whoever deserves, got it. In fact, he said, somebody has commented, that if you shed tears for God in any of your past lives, is a very strong comment to pass. If you truly cried for God in any of your past lives, you will come to Ramakrishna because it is your right to claim your inheritance. You will be attracted. 
when I meet people from other religions or people from no religion, in today, there's a professor in, in California who reacts, says, Long, I love Ramakrishna. I said, I know, my boy, you must have cried one day for God in one of your, one of your life, this life of prayer. That's why you attracted. You see, this is, look what he's asking for. The passport you require to the spiritual kingdom is just this tremendous love for God which makes you shed tears in the name of God. If you shed, shed one, drop of, one drop of tear in the name of God, you got your passport to spirituality. This is, the, this is the affirmation of this modern proponent. So here is the story. Let me just continue with the story. <clears throat> now, you see, one day this Mathur Babu thought, this is good stuff. The way he kind of, is kind of lit up in the, in, the, in the spiritual experience, I want that too. He decided, I must have it too. Look, he's the master of the temple, he's controlling everything. Why can't he just kind of demand experience, <coughs> spiritual experience? So he kept telling Ramakrishna, I want spiritual experience like you. I must have a you know, kind of glimpse of this spiritual experience. Give it to me, give it to me. And the Ramakrishna used to do like this. And then, you see, don't do that to Ramakrishna. He will give you. When you ask for high things, you will get it like that from him. And then this Mathur Babu state one day suddenly altered. He got up in the morning and everywhere he looked, he saw nothing but the mother goddess. The walls, the, everything appeared to be like mother goddess, made of, you see, you can actually get experience like that. And now, you see, he can't do any of his, you know, wars, commerce, because he's in a different mood, he's kind of lit up all the time, his eyes are like that, and red, and he can't work. And he was like that for a few days, he couldn't do any normal work anymore, because he's in a different mood all the time. It doesn't suit him at all, and he's struggling, he's trying to get out of it. <laughs> Then when they said, what's happened to you? I said, I don't know, I'm in trouble. Get this father here. You know, he's done this to me. So they brought the father back, <laughs> sort him out. Look, you asked for it. He said, you asked for it. He said, take it back. I can't handle it. I... You see, until you are ready for spirituality, the spiritual experience will be too overwhelming. Your system cannot adopt. You cannot even, you know, you cannot, you cannot absorb it. It will really rattle your system. It will break you. In fact, it is said, Unless you are truly prepared for spirituality, if it comes to you by accident, it can create real chaos in your life. Your whole being must become prepared, you know, through a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work, to, you know, to start stepping on the, on the various steps for spirituality. When you are ready, your whole system, your body, your mind, your intellect is ready. And then when spiritual begins to flow through, you can absorb it, you can digest it, and you can, you can make use of it and become more enlivened. But if you are not ready, there are cases, I won't mention anybody, but there are cases where some spiritual personalities hit on spirituality almost accidentally. And they come with fanatic ideas. Because they are not able to digest the comprehensive nature of spirituality, they come out with very fanatic versions. They become fanatics. So this necessary requirement of having this maturity to absorb spirituality and if you get it too early, it cannot really sit well with you. You will be in trouble. You will be, become schizophrenic. You become too mind. You don't know where you belong. So Mathur Babu said, look, you keep it. And when my time comes to you sort me out, then at that time, at the moment, let me carry on with my, you know, my, my normal commerce. He gave it back because he couldn't absorb it. He couldn't rise up to, it, up to the level. You need that level. At the same time, the story continues. Is this Ramakrishna now is so enlightened, living, if you like, in continually interacting with the Mother Goddess, various other things become visible. And that's what I like to study. If a person sees God as a personality in our times, exactly what does he see, how does he see, and why can't we see? What is the actual significance of a person saying, I can see Mother Goddess, but the rest of us say, he's mad, there's nothing, nothing there, he's just talking to thin air. What actually happens? Let's touch on that. You see, what happens is this. All of us, even though we don't know, we are actually using or individualizing the same mind to experience the world we see in front of us. That is why we agree that this is the carpet, this is the, the wall, this is... We have a... Somehow, without having to check, we seem to agree with all these things that we see around us. We share this common view regarding the world. We are operating at the same mental level. There is a mind in which the world is reflected. We just individualize this mind and see it from our own perspective from this particular body. 
but we are in a way using the same mind. What happens when you become spiritually, you know, if you like infused is this. Now you see, you see this world at a deeper level. So the same world you see as something else superimposed in this world, which is not just, just kind of a mental conjuring trick, but something that is much more deeper becomes visible, which is not visible to the rest of humanity. And that thing that you see is far more intense and clearer than the world that you see in front of you. It becomes that clear. So the person who is spiritually enlightened will see the mother goddess here, he will be able to interact, actually touch her, see her, because he is operating at a different level of the mind. So it is really feel like the, the level at which you operate becomes much more intensified and then spirituality becomes experiential. So for him it was a real, real case. There are some interesting things that are kind of become visible in his story. He would say, sometimes, actually I could hear the mother goddess, you know, the, the, the anklets on her feet, kind of ringing, she's walking in the courtyard, and I would, see, she, I would see her walking. What clothes does she wear? How does she look? Do you know how do you do that? It is really the love of the devotee that decides on what form the mother goddess will take, what sari she is going to wear. It is his mind that conjures up that, if you like, the mold and the spirituality fills that mold and comes alive. So whenever you see her, she said, he would say that sometimes she would be, would, I would see her with flowing hair, climbing up to the terrace and looking at Calcutta. You see, the imagery is something that he manufactures or who he imposes, his mind imposes, is filled by spirituality, you know, encapsulated in that particular mold, becoming visible. And this is not just matter, make or make believe. It is very real because the world that we see is almost dreamlike. That world is real. That is much more real than this reality. Very intense. And this is how we would see the mother goddess interact with her. And one day there was a nice interesting story. He would ask questions of her as well. And I like this story. He said, Mother, I saw you in the morning in the courtyard and I looked, there was no shadow. You did not cast it. The sun was up there, there was no shadow. And then at night also I took this oil lamp and went all around you looking for your shadow to see if you cast a shadow on the wall or on the floor. Mother, why don't you cast a shadow? And the answer is, you see this, 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 the, the narration between the, the, the devotee and the, the object of his devotion is very interesting. The mother got a smile and said, my boy, it is I who light up the sun, light up the moon, light up everybody, even your intellect. What light can you shine on me? Everything else shines by my light. How can your earthly light shine me or if you like fall on me and create a shadow? I am that which gives light to everything. How can anything, you know, light me? Otherwise I'll create a, put a shadow. And theologically when I look at it, I shudder. See the depth, spiritual experience coming to the rescue. You see, the thing that lights up the whole of this creation, including our intellect, that allows us to make sense of the world, all that, you see, now when you try and throw the light of intellect on that thing that is lighting up everything, it's going to fail. So our, our, our if you like, all our kind of attempts to try and encapsulate spirituality through every particular method we can choose, including our intellect, is going to fail. Because that lights up the intellect. So how can the intellect possibly throw light on it? Otherwise it lost its potency. It is so satisfying to get this from the story of Ramakrishna is searching for Mother Goddess's shadow. There was something else that becomes visible philosophically. Again this man, you know, throws light, unusual light on some deeper philosophic questions. There's another interesting question that arises in modern philosophy. Which says, is there really free will? Or is it just make-believe? The issue of free will has always bothered mankind. Are we really free? Can we really make a free decision? Because really every decision we make is dictated the way we have been brought up and the constitution we possess. These two will interact and make us decide on something. It could just come out of nowhere. Is there a real free will or is everything predetermined? It's a serious issue that arises. And when this Ramakrishna was asked, he said, oh, this is easy. Let me tell you an example. He said, it's a bit like a goat tied with a rope and you know, kind of pegged somewhere. The goat, if the goat was felt that it's tied up, it doesn't have the freedom, it will stop feeding. It's still restricted. Because the rope is loose, the goat feels that it has got freedom. So it goes chewing grass all over and moves about. 
this is the condition of humanity. You are made to think you have free will. <laughs> Otherwise, you will stop being human. You become machines. So the idea of free will is something that you inherit because without it, you can't be classed as a living thing. It is embedded. But just as this world is made of appearance, that free will is also appearance. To fight one appearance, you are given another appearance. To fight this appearance, this creation in which you exist, you are given the appearance that you have free will to decide your future and thus dictate yours. Otherwise, you can't think you are a living being. You see, these important philosophic issues, by this rustic, who is hardly studied at universities, this marvelous explanation, marvelous deep thinking visible in the life of this Ramakrishna. Let me continue the story. Bit of philosophy, let it go in as well. The story continues. This Ramakrishna is enlightened. Now you see, whenever an enlightened person becomes visible, those who deserve to get replies or answer to the question will automatically be attracted by this personality. And lots of people throughout India, from throughout India, would visit him in the middle of the night sometimes. A lot of this is not recorded anywhere. Anybody who was deserving would go and visit him. They'll find him, they'll visit him. All sorts of interesting people started to visit Sri Ramakrishna in droves. They would come in the morning, after the middle of the night, they'll find him. They'll sit with him, he will sort out, resolve their difficulties, issues, and they will send them away. He was dishing out spirituality. Whoever deserved it would visit him. All sorts of interesting people came. Let me give some, some of the stories. They are lovely personalities. One day he said a sadhu came. And this sadhu had one book, thick book under his armpit. And every morning the sadhu would open the book and turn the pages slowly. Next day another page, or next hour, after half an hour another page he would keep. And this Ramakrishna said, I went. And I said, can I have a look at your book? You read it so meticulous every day. You take hours to read the book. Hours you spend turning pages and reading. I want to read the book. The sadhu said, here. And Ram, this is Ram Krishna's word. He said, I opened the book. I turned the page. On the page was the word Ram. I turned the page. The next page said Ram. I turned the page. The next page said Ram. <laughs> he was living on one word but repeating it, you know, kind of re, kind of revigorating it with every turning. Of the, and he was taking his time. Ah, Ram again. <laughs> ah, Ram. You see, spirituality is that intense, that one-pointed. It doesn't need scattering. We sometimes think that we need intellectual capacity, you know, trying to expand on this idea of spirituality. What expand? It is not an a, a, a enterprise which looks for divergence. It's an enterprise which looks for convergence, unification. If one word can capture spirituality, it is contained in that word the Hindus have been using for thousands of years. What more do you need? You don't need all these heavy shastras and fellow in the six uh, um, darshans. You know, you don't need six schools of philosophy to understand. Ah, Ram, next page, next to it's exciting. Now let me look at the next chapter. Turn the page. Ah, Ram. <laughs> so Ram Krishna said, this man had hit the target. And he was showing it with this little book that was carrying around. But he was making visible spirituality in different mold. One day another sadhu came. You see, all these marvelous people used to visit him because he would draw them. You see, here is the honey pot. People will come, they will be drawn by him. He said, this sadhu would get up in the morning, look at the spiritual experience of personalities. He would look around, smile and say, ah, what wonderful, what wonderful. And just smile and feel lifted. You know what was happening? Remember the thing we talked about right at the start, Brahmagnan. You see, the most comprehensive vision of spirituality, the most comprehensive experience of spirituality is when everything turns to spirit. Everything is nothing but, you see, you stop seeing this variation, you see the underpinning. And when you see, you know what happens at the same time? It's not that you see just unification. You get a thrill, the kick, biggest kick you can ever get. It's the most sweetest experience. Adi Shankara Kosi, you know, he says, spirituality of Brahman is defined as asti, bhati, priya. It is the sweetest of the sweet. It is neither pleasure nor pain. It is bliss. Ten for million for more thunderous, much more powerful than the idea of pleasure. Pleasure is a trinket. And that you experience. Imagine that. You open your eyes and you look around and say, Brahman, Brahman. Nothing but Brahman. I don't see the variation. I see the underpinning. You see, again, you see, let me tell you. 
if you evolve spiritually, as you evolve spiritually, you begin to notice that it is not what we are aware of that is important, but awareness itself, astitva, existence itself is the most thrilling. So rather than what exists and what draws my attention is secondary, existence itself becomes primary. And my focus is no longer what exists, but on existence itself. And the moment I'm, I'm embedded in this experience of existence itself, I get a thrill, the biggest kick. And this sadhu was saying, ah, look at this, look at this. And when we say, ah, we wish we get that. You get a real kick. You are looking for a kick? What kick? This is the real stuff. So this kind of sadhus was passed by. One day a sadhu came and this sadhu had not cut his nails, not cut his hair and many hippies would like this story. <laughs> he was completely in his element. He came, started singing great, you know, kind of slokas to the mother goddess, loud voice, everybody came running, what's happening? He couldn't bother, he was in his own flow, not wearing any clothes and by the way, and with long hair, long nails, and uh, people said, throw him out. He's like a nuisance, you know, shouting and, you know, singing. And, and Ramakrishna was watching. You see, oh, he was drawing all these people near him. He was watching. They kicked him out. Now, in the temple, there was a, 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 a kind of a, a routine that all the poor people would be served food free every day in the afternoon. So there will be tens of hundreds of people sitting in, in a line, all being served food from the temple for their lunch time, free food given. And there are all these kind of very poor people sitting and eating. And this sadhu in this weird mood decided to join them. <laughs> and he went there. Those poor people, they couldn't tolerate him. <laughs> it, was, they, it was too much for them. They shoved him away. They said, go away. So he couldn't even sit with them. <laughs> he was pushed away. And this sadhu smiled, laughed, you know, big laughter. And then he found that there were some dogs eating the leftovers that were in the corner somewhere. Kutra, you know, they were eating. Leftover, they were just kind of left out. Even the beggars had left it. That stuff they were eating. And this sadhu smiled, laughed, went near, put his arm around the neck of one of the dogs and said, let's go for it, boy. <laughs> I eat with you. And he was eating with the dogs. And... Everyone was saying, mad, utter madness. You see, in order to recognize what was there, you need a person of equal caliber. And this Ramakrishna looked and he told his Banya, Radai, this man is Paramhans. He sees God in everybody. He couldn't be bothered with any of your conventions. He's defying every convention you throw at him. He, just, he will bend it, he'll break it. He's beyond all convention. He's beyond all regulation. He's hit the target. He sees nothing but God. He has no difficulty in eating with the, with, with the dogs. He couldn't be bothered. He is at that very exalted state. And Banyo said, this is good because I like some teacher like that. I was looking for this kind of, and this mama is not helping me too much. So he decided to follow that madman. And he chased, went off. When the madman finished his dinner with the dogs, he decided to go for a, you know, go carry on. And this Radha followed him. He said, Maharaj, I know who you are. I know who you are. These are lovely stories, real stories. I know who you are. Please make me your disciple. These things happen. You know, in our family, sometimes we don't value the people, our own people. We look for somebody else to value. So this Radha, who instead of living, is bothering with his mama, decided to chase after this man, this madman. He said, make me your disciple. You are a Paramahansa. I know, I've been told, you are the top. Make me your disciple. And the Paramahansa looked at him and he said, okay. Can you see this dirty gutter water? He said, yes. When you think it is as pure as the water of the Ganges flowing nearby, you are ready to join me. <laughs> <laughs> so Radhe was worried, this mad man, <laughs> he'll, he'll, next, he'll ask me to drink the gutter water now. <laughs> so this Radhe was worried, he said, no, no, but I still want to follow you. Please let me follow you. So he went after him, still continued to follow him. Now this madman, I told you, he breaks every convention. He picked up a piece of rock. He said, now come near me. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> He's about to hit him. He doesn't care for any convention. And they said, enough. No more discipleship. <laughs> I go back to my mama. <laughs> he left quickly. You see, various personalities of various caliber used to visit Sri Ramakrishna. Many, many. Look, I tell you. 
From what I know, you get many different kinds of personalities in the Hindu tradition. There are those who have discovered God for themselves, they sing and dance and thrill the rest of us, make the rest of us feel this spirituality God is for real. We get a glimpse by looking at the lives of some of these super person, lovely personalities, marvelous they are. There are others who are equally enlightened, but who can perhaps look after their own welfare and their own salvation, if you like, their own, if, their own pathway. But once in a while you find a personality who is able to dish out spirituality left, right and center, who can give salvation to others, who can carry others, lift them up. This Ramakrishna belongs to that category. He is not a mere bhakta of Kali and we will look at his life and we get a thrill. If you are sincere about spirituality and if you approach a personality of this caliber, you can't go wrong. He doesn't only have the power of seeing God or spirituality experience it for himself. He has the power to pass it on to anybody who desires, who seriously desires spirituality. He will dish it out. In fact, some people say, you know, I, this is standard stuff, let me tidy up. You know, when they say we ask Ramakrishna for this, we keep asking Ramakrishna for this, he doesn't give it. I think there's a reason. Do you know why? There are various levels of teachers. There are teachers who will say, give him, okay, it's little, my little boy is asking, well, let's give it to him. He wants what a big house, he wants to win the lottery, let him have it. This is a hard task master. He doesn't give just what you want. He will give what he thinks you deserve, what you need. He will insist. He will not give you a secondary prize. He wants to give you the highest prize. He will not do anything. He will. The others are easy to please. There are many deities who will say, what do you want? Come here, I give it to you, sort you out. He will say, I will not sort you out. Sort you out. You, don't need, you need the highest. Don't ask for the silly things. He won't listen. He will only give the highest. In fact, there is a lovely story, you know, again taught by Ramakrishna. He said there are three kinds of doctors in this world. Now, Dr. Kaka will say, yes, I think I must listen to this, it's important. <laughs> the first kind of doctors are, you go to them and the doctor will look at your illness and say, okay. You know, standard stuff in National Health Service, just prescription, send him off. They'll give you a prescription and send you off. And that's the end of the story until you come back again and say, still not sorted, another prescription, send him off. Standard stuff, standard doctors. Ramakrishna, these are the doctors of the lowest caliber. The doctors which are of higher caliber will not only give you prescription, they'll check up what happened. Did it make any difference? Did you improve? They will be concerned about your health and will phone you or find out from you whether the prescription worked. These are the second category of doctors. But Ramakrishna, these are still not really that good. There's a third category, the highest category of doctors. They will say, I gave you prescription, did you take it? And you said, no, I didn't take it, I didn't like it, didn't agree with me. They'll come to your house, throw you on the floor, sit on your chest, open your mouth and stuck it in, stick it in. These are very tough doctors. <laughs> they will make sure you get better. They won't let you off. We wish to find a doctor, a spiritual, a personality in spirituality who will be equally insistent in making sure we are cured. They will not phobia off superficially by giving you little presents and phobia off. They will make sure you hit the high and nothing less. You don't get away with anything less. These are the spiritual giants. This is what this guy is all about. Very hard taskmaster. He won't give you trivial things. But if you ask for the highest, you can't find a higher being to ask for the highest than this personality. He's that dramatic, that dynamic. Everybody, anybody or everybody who has ever actually really truly desired God will somehow or other discover this personality and hopefully achieve their target, reach their target. Let me continue with the story of Sri Ramakrishna. So various people come, pass through Dakshineshwar, interact with Ramakrishna and the story continues. This personality has not just come for his own salvation. He has come for the first time. You see the unique feature about this personality is he has come to reconcile the various strands of spirituality that were not properly reconciled. They were loose and sitting scattered. This personality came to tie them up. You see it is like finding a, a thread, a sutra in which you can, you can then, then put you know, beads of different colors and turn it into a great lovely little necklace. 
you required a sutra, one individual who could link up all the various aspects of spirituality in one life and reconcile and turn this into a marvelous necklace, a colorful, comprehensive necklace, which allows us to relate to the idea of spirituality in the most widest possible sense. And this is what he was all about. The story continues. People not only see that, that as soon as this started, I mean, his spiritual experience came to maturity. Various different strands, if different sectarian movements of Hinduism started to appear on the scene. First we see, if you like, the, the introduction to this ancient idea of Hindus called Tantra. Now the Tantric tradition has required a very bad reputation. It is considered something illicit, something kind of obnoxious, Vamachar is called. So the first people who arrive here on the scene to get their credentials, to get some marks, are the Tantrics. They appear now on the field in, in the story of Ramakrishna. One day this Ramakrishna was standing in the garden looking, you know, tending the flowers or something and they saw a boat arrive on the bank of the river Ganga and from there a light, a light, a, 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 come out a young woman, a middle-aged woman really, who was very fair and very beautiful. And this woman stepped on the, st on, the on the shores and this Ramakrishna quickly went into his room and told his Baniya, come here Radai, go and call that woman, tell her that your mama wants to see her. Radai said, this man never sees a woman and he wants to see a woman, a beautiful woman? Mama, mama, I don't know what he's up to now. So let me check. So he went to that woman called Brahmani and said, my mama who spends his time worshipping the mother goddess has requested that you visit him. Brahm Brahmani said, yes, I was looking for him all the time, where is he? Ramprade said, even she seems to know him, fair enough. <laughs> he brought her to the room. The moment this Brahmani came, look, let me tell you who this Brahmani is, little bit of background. I told you different characters will appear in the story of Ram. They are all individual, they are highly different, unusual, and they are all woven into the story in a most colourful manner. This Brahmani is an expert tantric in, in her time. She was very well known. She had mastered the tantric siddhis. She was siddh. And this lady, you see this ancient idea of tantra somehow has been, as I said, misunderstood and misrepresented. It was a very positive way of becoming spiritually enlightened. It talks about this idea that spirituality can be experienced through kundalini yoga. Very ancient practice. Somehow it has never sat well with the Vedantic practice, which is more philosophically oriented. And here we see the reconciliation of the Tantra with the Vedanta through the arrival of this individual called Brahmani. And Ramakrishna called her and she immediately responded. She said, I was looking for you. I was told by the Mother Goddess that I should look out for three personalities. I already met the other two and I was looking for you. You are special, you are chosen. And the mother, at the bidding of the Mother Goddess, I am here. The story unfolds. Now this Ramakrishna already established in realization of the mother of the universe, as spirituality, as a personality, super personality, is the mother goddess. Says, oh, you've been sent here by the mother goddess? What do you want me to do? She said, now I'm going, there are 64 practices of Tantra that I want you to practice and achieve all the Siddhis. What are these Siddhis and what's all about? You see, all of us have possessed tremendous powers of mind, tremendous power, but they lay latent in us. This is an ancient, ancient science the Hindus have discovered for a long time. It has laid, kind of, you know, not been kind of fully pro invoked in society. It is laid hidden in society. And she said, I come with powers to make you, if you like, achieve this tremendous siddhis, make you a true yogi and develop tremendous powers. Ramakrishna said, if Mother Goddess said, let's go for it. <laughs> this is how it did. This is the story. So now, Within a few days, this Brahmani puts Ramakrishna under, he undergoes all these various difficult tantric practices. Within a few days, literally, he covers them instantly without any difficulty. He's a master already, he has no difficulty. And in his life they become reconciled. But now let me show you the power of this Ramakrishna. He goes to tantra tradition, he achieves you know, full marks, he passes the test. There is, you see, some people say Tantra means, you know, kind of somehow involved with sex or with drinking wine, with Ramakrishna, nothing of, nothing of this sort was ever achieved, nothing of this sort was ever used. He passed with the Tantric practices, but look at this person and his abhorrence to Siddhis. 
He could not be bothered with any siddhis. He acquired them, but he was not bothered. While he was there, the two other tantric who had achieved tremendous powers came to visit Sri Ramakrishna. As told you, all of them will be attracted to him. They all came to visit him. And when they came, one was called Girija, other was called Chandra. They came to see him. They had tremendous power. This is recorded in the story of Ramakrishna, believe it or not. This Girija could actually from his body throw light and in the middle of the night light up the whole sky from his body. And the, both of them had the power of becoming invisible at will. As soon as they came near Ramakrishna or Dakshineshwar, see the Ramakrishna saw that these guys have lost their path. The aim of Tantra is not to achieve Siddhis, it is in fact to achieve God realization. Siddhis are a distraction. They stop your path, they stop you from making spiritual progress and they had become an obstruction to these two youngsters. The moment they came near Ramakrishna, he pulled the Siddhis away. Forget about him being a Siddha, he was able to pull away somebody else's Siddhi. He pulled the carpet under the floor and they lost the Siddhis in front of him. They could not do these things. And Ramakrishna warned them that Tantras are not in order to achieve Siddhis. You see, again we hear in the Hindu stories, Lots of Siddha Purush who have got tremendous powers, mental powers, they can make things make things disappear, all that. Here comes the, 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 the if you like, the, the Ramakrishna's understanding and explanation to what the Siddhi is all about. He says, keep away. They are a byproduct. And you know, when you take medicine, you don't want side effects. These are side effects in the process of spiritual enlightenment. You don't encourage side, you know, side effects. I mean, if you are a doctor, like I say, when if you take medicine, even side effects have to be demolished. You don't take medicine to get side effects. That's exactly what you don't do. Here are these two practitioners who were using the side effects as the end product. And they came near him and he pulled them away. Again, you see, a modern vision of Hinduism. We recognize the powers of Siddhi. Keep them at bay. Do not be distracted by them. Focus on making spiritual progress, deciding, discuss, you know, finding your own like path to God. Let me touch on some interesting mystical aspect, colorful aspect of Ramakrishna. You see, this man, now his master, would explain to us or tell his disciples in later life what happens when you are successful <coughs> with the Kundalini. This is what he said. He said, when you are successful in, in, in mastering this, or power, you know, in walking the Kundalini power, when you sit still and sit upright, you begin to feel a, a, a kind of tingling sensation at the bottom of your base of your spine and this tingling begins to start to rise in your spinal cord. You can feel it actually rise. It can move sometimes very slowly, like an ant climbing up. Sometimes it can wiggle and move very fast. There are different ways it will come up. And the moment it moves above your, your, your belly button level, the moment it, look, I'm telling you, this happens. This is not make-believe. It really happens. The moment it goes above the belly level and it comes near the heart level, you lose body consciousness and you see the most brilliant light in front of you. This is real. And then it mustn't stop. If it's just at the heart center, what you get is the most brilliant vision of light. You see light and nothing but light. You lose body consciousness. You see tremendous light in front of you. In the beginning you feel the light is something that you are experiencing. The moment this experience becomes more condensed, much more kind of, much more kind of intense, you suddenly discover that you are not separate from the light, you are the light. You experience that. The body feeling is gone. This is the process of Kundalini. It moves on. When it hits this particular center near the neck, once it hits that, it can never fall below that level. You are safe now. Nothing can, nothing can distract you. Nothing but the thought of God will attract you. If anybody talks about anything but God, you will feel that somebody is hitting you with a hammer. You can't stand it. Only God attracts you. Once that Kundalini Shakti arrives to your throat center. Now all these marvelous ideas, or this, this, this kind of, you know, this Kundalini Shakti Tantra we consider to be second rate, kind of left-handed pathway of spirituality, we discarded. In the life of Ramakrishna, to see their, their potency and also to see their limitation. Not to allow them to become a distraction. Because the moment this happens, you develop tremendous mental powers. You can read somebody's mind, you can make things appear, you can do fantastic things. But this Ramakrishna warns us. In his life, he never used any of the Siddhis. Never! Oh.
what we are looking at is the life of a modern proponent of Hinduism. You see, the Hindus are fixated on the idea that somebody who is spiritually enlightened must have lived in some golden age, you know, thousands of years ago. Uh, it's Ram and it's Krishna. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see, with those stories came in a lot of exaggerations. And these exaggerations are something that the modern youth cannot relate to. So it is necessary to present the idea of spirituality through proponents of modern, you know, Hinduism who are able to relate to the world that we live in, not the world that we lived in, but the one in which we live in now. So the idea of presenting this Katha, if you like, the story of Ramakrishna, trying to present some extraordinary material in the most ordinary language is what I am trying to do. In the first two sessions, we touched on this idea that this person appeared almost too ordinary to be anything special. And yet, right at a very young age, at the age of seven, he hit the high note of spirituality. What the Hindus promote as the highest spiritual experience, seeing the unity in diversity, seeing the whole of this manifested universe be, you know, be experienced as a unity, as a Brahman, where tremendous bliss flows within your system. This higher spiritual experience, the most comprehensive experience of spirituality was achieved by this young boy without any training at the age of seven. So he started with a very high knot and then he did not stop. Then the story went further, unfolded further. At the age of 17, he is transferred to Calcutta where the stage was being set up for him to try and bring, into, bring into, into, into existence this idea of more comprehensive vision of Hinduism, trying to relate to spirituality not only in the, in the, in the most um, esoteric sense, but also in the more, if you like, more popular sense, linking with spirituality as a super personality, as the mother of the universe. And this boy, after six years of very hard work, managed to bring this kind of this marvelous principle called spirituality into a personified form of the mother goddess and interact with this, with this personality. The story didn't stop there. Somehow it appears that in the life of this personality we are going to see the reconciliation of variety of different strands of Hinduism and this becomes visible. Because as soon as this happens we start seeing various teachers arriving at Dakshineshwar at the Kali temple and teaching this youngster various different, different disciplines of the Hindu tradition. And first we see a Brahmani arriving and, 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 and teaching Ramakrishna this idea of spirituality through the tantras. Now the tantric system has been vilified. It is considered to be something where you get drunk and the three words that become visible are mass, meat, madira and maithun. And this has been vilified in this dramatic manner. Let me just touch on this idea of tantra in, in its purest form and what it implies. You see, all of us are in a way kind of polarized. When we kind of interact with the rest of the universe, we are polarized either to relate to the things that we experience as either something that is attractive or something that we, are, we find aversion for, we run away from, we find it you know, kind of impulse, you know, we, we feel that it is not right and we run away from it. So there are two things that are very visible in our lives, attraction and aversion. Now what Tantra, the purest form of Tantra is trying to do is to tell us that if you can stop polarizing your experience of the universe by linking just to this idea of aversion and attraction, then you have mastered spirituality. Because now you are no longer linked up with this variation of experiences, but the experience itself. Now this may sound difficult, but let me just tell you how easy it is or how difficult it is. The greatest attraction we have as physical beings is gender attraction. We are strongly attracted to the person of another gender. This is inbuilt in us, all of us. It can, we cannot avoid this. And yet, you see, in the tantric practice, what we are trying to find is this. We are trying to see, suppose the most beautiful person is presented in front of us of the opposite gender, and we are able to kind of not be attracted. We are able to take on this very important challenge and not get attracted, not get drawn. Then we win. At the same time, we have aversion. So in the tantric practice, they will say, look, here is a skull. We are going to cook some meat in it and make you eat it in a skull. And you go, ah, aversion. This is why it appears very weird. The idea is to take away the polarization that we have regarding the idea of attraction and aversion and rise above both of them. This is the pure idea of tantra. And in the case of Ramakrishna, as I said, within a few days, he mastered all the tantric practices. 
And what, becomes, what happens is this, the moment you are successful, you acquire tremendous power because once you are able to stand up to this major force that attract all the human beings, attraction and aversion, when, when you are able to rise above it, you, gener you, 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 you discover tremendous powers within yourself, they become manifested, A's, A's, the Ashta Siddhis, the eight types of supernatural powers. And these were very visible in the life of Ramakrishna. And yet we see him offering, giving us a health warning, saying, keep away. The aim of Tantra is not to acquire the Siddhis, but to rise above all this such attraction and to discover God. That is the whole idea. So you must move away from the Tantric idea, the idea of Siddhis. This is very visible. The story is very interesting. At later stage, his chief disciple, Swami Vivekananda, visited Ramakrishna when Ramakrishna was about to pass away, give up his body. And Ramakrishna said, come here my boy, I have acquired all these eight Siddhis, Ashta Siddhis. You are going to do great things in this life and you can be, you're going to work so much, so well for me. I would like to give them to you as a gift. It will help you with your work. Like the teacher, the disciple is equal to the task. He said, keep them. Master, I am not interested in the Siddhis. My aim is God realization and nothing else will ever attract me. He just, he, you see, just as the Master is so, 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 so kind of careful, the disciple is equal to the task. He too rejected the Siddhis. It's an interesting thing for us. To, you see, when we study the story of Ramakrishna, we come across various interactions with various personalities, various ideas, various themes that are visible in Hindu tradition but are not properly been understood. So as I said, the pure idea of Tantra is basically to stop polarizing our interaction with the rest of creation through aversion and attraction and rise above it. That is a pure idea. And yet it becomes degenerate and it's necessary to purify it. And the, 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 the fruits that you gain from Tantra is something again you need to move away from and not be attracted to. And again, this is visible in the story of Ramakrishna as well as his chief disciple, Swami Vivekananda. Let me tell you something else why this Sri Ramakrishna is so attractive. In the story of Ramakrishna, the reason why, for example, I am attracted to Ramakrishna is because here I find somebody who is talking about religion, about spirituality from first and experience. Book learning doesn't bother him. He's not interested in book learning. He's not interest, interested in intellectual kind of gymnastics. He's beyond that. He's interested in the first hand, pratyaksh. It must be visible. Spirituality must become visible. It must be something to experience here and now. This is what attracts me or attracts me to Sri Ramakrishna. Spirituality that can be experienced. Experience. We want that. We want that thrill. We are talking about this bliss, we hear of this bliss, we want to experience this bliss. We wish to, you know, dive into this blissful state. We want that, nothing less will do. This is the requirement. And this is why I am attracted to him. That is why thousands of human beings are attracted to this personality, because there is no other sign. Look at him. There's nothing to draw you towards him. Seems so simple. Too simple, in fact. There are no external signs. He doesn't grow horns or anything like that. And yet he's such an attractive personality because he's a spiritual, you want to experience, come here. This is why I'm attracted. This is why lots of people are attracted. This is why Swami Vivekananda is attracted. And when people say, where is your authority about Hinduism? I pass the buck, as I told you last time, to Swami Vivekananda. And he passes it on to this fellow, saying he knows. It is the groundwork that he has put through these various experiences in Dakshineshwar. They become, the, if you like, the, the feeding ground of modern Hinduism. This is where modern Hinduism becomes, becomes visible and is going to in, in influence the rest of the world in no uncertain terms. So this is the foundation of this, this modern proponent of Hinduism. And the groundwork is being carried out. So first we have this idea of the tantras being tidied up. The story doesn't stop there. Next, you see this Ramakrishna, remember his, his, parent, his lineage is strongly dedicated to the idea of Raghuvir. Ram. So Ram must enter the story too. So now you see, it's just like you know, when, the, when, when, when this thing is being wound up, various personalities visit Dakshineshwar. And the next person to come to Dakshineshwar is somebody, a sadhu called Jatadhari. Now this sadhu had a little man, metal image of Sri Ram, baby Ram. It's called Ram Lala. 
Now he looks at the image as if it's alive. He feeds it, he talks to the image. People think, of course, he's gone mad. But he sees the real God there. The other people cannot recognize it, but this Ramakrishna can recognize. And he realizes this person is realized. He's able to see real God playing and interacting with him through this little figure. This figure has come alive. Now you see, for the rest of us, you may think, now exactly what is this? Is he perhaps gone a bit mad? I mean, how can he possibly see things which the rest of us cannot see? Let me tidy up, because it may appear as if it is, this is his own, own, he's living in his own <coughs> mental world. He's gone mental, in fact. Let me tidy up. When, for example, God becomes visible to you in front of you in real life, we are successful. Do you know what it's like? The intensity with which you experience this God is far superior than the intensity with which you experience the rest of human beings. They appear like cutouts. So you can't, you can imagine the cutouts can never see this real living thing. They are cutouts. So other people say, well, what is he talking about? Well, they're, they're just like little shadows. They chatter. What is he on about? And yet, the person and that ideal, the deity, becomes alive. They interact in the most personal manner. And the reason why it becomes possible is because this person and that person are closely linked. They are both spiritual beings and they are visible to each other because they are both spiritual beings and not material beings. So the rest of the material kingdom doesn't bother them. But that experience is not some fuzzy experience, not some make-believe experience. It is a dramatic, very on, very real experience. God is more visible than the rest of humanity. That is how it is, how dramatic it is. So here is the Jatadhari playing with Ram. Nobody else recognizes what is happening. And at the end of the, his, his stay at Dakshineshwar, he told Ramakrishna, you are the right person to look after this, this Ram Lala. I am going to leave him to you. And I have done my, my life's work and I will go away now. And since that time, look at the story unfolding. This little baby, this baby Ram, comes alive in the story of Ramakrishna. Look, I am trying to give you, tell you an extraordinary story in the most ordinary language I, can, I possess. And yet, I cannot compromise it. Now this is what Ramakrishna says. He says, sometimes I would take this baby Ram to take a, take, take a bath in the river Ganga. He would splash water, he would be very naughty and I would scold him saying, stop it, you can't do that. It's time, you're enough. No, I want to stay in the water. No, enough now, come out. You can't stay too long. And he would cry and I would drag him away and tell him off and he would sulk. Can you imagine <coughs> this kind of interaction in this day and age with a living God in our times? Real, very real, my friends. There is nothing make-believe here comes alive. You see, in the earlier stage of the story, we saw this idea of Ramakrishna relating to spirituality personalized as the, as the, as the Divine Mother. In the second part of the story, see the relationship is, ah, God is my mother. I am a little child at the mercy of the Lord, of the Mother Goddess. The second part of the story says, Ah, God is a child at my mercy. I can tell him off. See, the variation visible within the Bhakti movement becomes visible in the story of Ramakrishna. And do you know why all these different chapters are unfolding? I told you, here is a personality that is trying to, to show the various strands of Hinduism reconciled in one life. One of the most astute professors of religious education in the Western world, very famous, called Professor Ninian Smart, said this of Ramakrishna. He said, before Ramakrishna came on the stage, Hinduism was a scattered enterprise. All the different strands of Hinduism were lay scattered. Nobody was able to reconcile the various strands. In one life, he managed to kind of sew together all these various strands and turn into a beautiful tapestry, seamless tapestry of Hinduism in its brightest form. In one life, reconcile. Whenever you reconcile, you get a thrill. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. When bits of pieces fit together and you begin to see a greater picture, you get a kick, don't you? In the same way, Hinduism that was lying scattered in one life was going to be tied up by this one personality. So the story starts, carries on. The idea of God is the mother. God is a baby in your, at your mercy, very visible in the story of Ramakrishna. All the bhakti ideas, very visible in the story of Ramakrishna. He practices various various different bhavas the Hindus talk about. The Shanta bhav, 
the vatsalya bhav, dasya bhav, the madhura bhav, thinking of God as your sweetheart. He practiced all of them. At the end of all his practices, within a few days, everything he practiced, within a few days, he hit the, he, he was managed to reach his conclusion. Every form of bhakti he, he, he practiced. He reached the conclusion in a very short time. During this period, you see the visions of various gods and goddesses, Ram, Krishna becoming visible to this one personality, in one personality. See, very interesting. So this is how the story continues to unfold. <coughs> then the story doesn't stop there. You go a stage further. You see, there has been, in the, in the story of Rama Krishna, we find the reconciliation of variety of different approaches in spirituality. And the three major movements in the, philo the philosophic movements of the Hindus are the Dvaita tradition, which says you and God are essentially different. You need to build a relationship with God and that's all you can do. The Dvaita tradition. The Vishishta Dvaita tradition, which says that even though you and God are different, we are not that different. God is like the fire, you are like the spark. Essentially the same, but you are not equal carrier to God. The Vishishta Dvaita tradition. Then there is a third one set up by Adi Shankara, the Advaita tradition, which is philosophically extremely satisfying. Now, before you even begin the Advaita tradition, you see, because look, I'm now reconciling bhakti with jnana. And you may think jnana means you sit down and you know, you kind of smoke a pipe and think about spirituality in an intellectual manner. Nothing of the sort. <coughs> the Gnana Mark is equally experiential. It is not purely intellectual, you know, kind of, you know, you know fly off in your thoughts, thought structure. It is something that can be experienced equally dramatically. Gnana Mark can be experienced. Yes, it can be experienced. And without experience, I say religion is worthless. If anybody talks about religion, with, with, look, whenever you come across any religious personality, friends, simple example, I'm telling you, litmus test. Ask yourself, don't ask me, don't even ask him sometimes, ask yourself, is this person talking about spirituality from experience or is it just book learning? Ask yourself. You will be able to very quickly suss out the real masters from the, from the charlatans. You see, there are so many on the, in the market, this market is crowded and everybody is making claims for themselves. They are all kind of, oh, I can't even, look, let me tell you. With Ramakrishna, I will stop using the word Shri. Because there are so many Shri's around, including Shri, <laughs> Shri Lakhani, you know, and they are doing Astarte. They are nuisance. <laughs> you see, with Ramakrishna, I don't use the word Shri even. Do you know why? <coughs> if you love somebody, if you feel so close to somebody, Shri is like, in a way, like saying Mr. Respectful title. If you really love somebody, would you put Shri in front of him? If you met your father, would you say, uh, Mr. Father? Shri father, it's a father, it's a mother, you say, would you, you don't need to kind of put a top and tail. When you love somebody, you take the tops and tails away, kick them out. You have no time for that. You need to grab the person, the one who is the middle of the middle of this kind of labels. You need to grab that. So here is this Ramakrishna now reconciling, if you like, this idea of bhakti with the jnana. Now Adi Shankara says, in order for you to be established in Gnana Mark, look, this is experiential religion with Adi Shankara too. You require four things. Vivek, discrimination between what is real and what is not real. Not fancy or fanciful thing, but things which are real, which will stand the test. Vivek, Vairagya, dispassion. Then, Shatta Sampati. These are the kind of things which require Sam, Dham, Uparati, Titiksha, Samadhan and Shraddha. And the fourth one, the fourth one is Mumokshvatva. Mumokshvatva means you feel tremendous attraction towards the idea of God. Tremendous. Now all these instruments that you require, the tools that you require, are already visible in the story of Ramakrishna. He doesn't have to kind of go to a university and, and develop any of these traits. He already possesses all of, the, all of this. So the student is ready. And it's time for the teacher to make an entrance. And the teacher is of equal caliber, very unique teacher. So one day in the, in the Dakshineshwar temple enters a very tall, a, a very, very kind of magnanimous, charismatic character. By the way, he's wearing no clothes, so he's off automatically, he draws attention. <laughs> he walks in. His name is 
Totapuri. He walks into the into the temple and he's in this different world. You see, this person is established in Advait. My essential nature is God. He's established. Day and night is established in the state of mind. He walks into the temple garden. And you see, these people have no kind of qualms, they are not, they have no, no purpose, they just wonder about the world because they are established in this God knowledge, knowledge that I am that. And he walks in, he's like a king, majestic. And he walks in, he sees this Ramakrishna sitting on the veranda of the temple. He looks at his face, the face is shining. This boy is suitable to receive the knowledge of Advaita. He thought, hmm, I've got the right pupil here. He said, come here, your face is shining. I wish to teach you Advaita, the highest philosophy. Would you like to learn it? And Ramakrishna, in a very casual voice, he said, let me ask my mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and Totapuri said, such a grown-up, he was about 23, he said, such a grown-up boy, and he still has to ask his mummy, okay, let him, let's please him. He said, okay, go and ask your mummy. He thought he'll go into the kitchen and ask his mummy. This Ramakrishna ran into the temple, Friends, think of this. We visit lots of temples and we see lots of deities. And we bow down and we look, in, and look, at, the, look at these lovely deities with appreciation, with tremendous love. And yet we see a stone image, stone image. Imagine this Ramakrishna state of mind. I told you, after this tremendous hard work, Mother Goddess was real for him. When he walks into the temple, just imagine, just imagine. For a moment, let yourself go. Imagine that you're walking into a temple and the deity of your choice is there. And when you, as you walk in, the hair on your body begins to stand up because you are coming face to face with the deity that you love. You walk in and you become, get a thrill. And then, you see, you raise your eyes to look at the deity and instead of seeing a stone image, you see the smiling face living, shining, looking back at you. What will happen? This is spirituality, real, experiential religion, real, not make-believe. This is the state of this Ramakrishna. He sees the mother goddess at will. He ran into the temple and after a few minutes came smiling, came out saying, very good. He went to Totapur, he said, look, my mommy said she had invited you here to teach me. <laughs> Like it, you know, you, you ask getting a tuition, somebody to give you tuition to your children. You know, you invite a teacher saying, teach maths, his boy is struggling with maths. And the teacher walks in and says, mommy called him. He said, my mommy said, she has brought you here to teach me Advait. So I'm per perfectly happy to practice this. Dottapuri said, no mommy has ever dictated to me and I don't charge fees and I, I'm not anybody's tutor. I don't know who is this mommy. Never mind, the boy's got a little bit kind of screw loose. Never mind, <laughs> I'll deal with him. Okay, said Totapuri, tomorrow you come, we start the process. You see, this is experiential religion of the highest form, Advait. You see, there is a, people think that they all are equal. In fact, there is a hierarchy. From the Advait, you proceed, progress to the Vishishta Advait. From the Vishishta Advait, because even here there is a bit of arbitrariness. You enter the Advait. There is a hierarchy. Not that one is wrong. There are different stages of development towards the same target. So this Ramakrishna says, I'm ready for Advait, my mommy said so. Ah, next day, come very early. You know how they start these people? Just after midnight, they begin the process. So it's not early, it doesn't mean 8 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock the Sindhi time. This is much earlier, <laughs> much earlier. More, the, the day starts much earlier. So they come, the boy is ready, they take a bath, in the river Ganga. Now, says, first thing first. First, I have to give you Diksha. You have to become a sannyasi. And Ramakrishna said, well, I don't mind, but my mummy, not the mother goddess, but the other mummy, the real one in the kitchen, she will be very, you know, worried if she sees that I've got uh, uh, taken sannyas and become a sannyasi. Don't worry, she doesn't have to know. So, this boy is asked to take Diksha. He takes the Diksha. He's asked to do his Shraddha ceremony. Shraddha means when you die, somebody, your, your, your descendants will do a Shraddha ceremony. Now here, if you want to become a sannyasi, you do your own Shraddha, because you can't wait to be, you know, have your children. 
to carry out your own shraddha sarim. He does that too. Early in the morning, before the sun has come up, time has come to start the process of Advait. So they go into a little little hut, which is just in that in that particular type part of the temple, uh, north of the temple. They go into the hut, quiet, and they sit. You know, the, the guru sits in front of the teacher, the student, and says, "Now sit cross-legged. Now, let me give you the, the the ultimate knowledge regarding what is everything. Focus your mind, close your eyes, and focus your mind here," said the teacher between the eyebrows. And think of nothing but your essential nature as the spirit. Now it sounds very simple, but this Ramakrishna is capable. So he closes his eyes, and just in a few seconds, he gets disturbed, he opens his eyes, and says, I can't do it. Tatapuri says, Why can't you do it? I am your teacher, I am ordering you to focus your mind there, just between the eyebrows. We begin the process of meditation. Ramakrishna says, My guru says so, I have to do it. He closes his eyes again. Becomes disturbed, opens his eyes, I can't do it. Totapuri said, what's the problem? He said, every time I close my eyes and focus my mind here, the blissful image of the mother goddess appears in front of me. Ah, my boy, you're meditating. Ah, sweet little boy. <laughs> she keeps popping up. Now, you see, Totapuri has no time for gods and goddesses. He said, look, take out the sword of Vivek, discrimination. Take the sword out. If the mother goddess appears, chop her in half. Chop her in half. The boy who has loves the mother goddess is now told to chop her in half. You see, we are now moving from the Dvait to the Advait. And that arbitrariness, the linkage, has to be kind of transcended. Ramakrishna says, I will try. Again he's struggling. Now Totapuri picks up a piece of sharp glass, which was on the floor. In India, you'll find all these glasses all the place, all of them. <laughs> he picks it up and makes a mark on his forehead, very harsh, hard. So it starts to bleed, the mark starts to bleed. Totapuri says, focus there now, my boy, see what happens. In the third attempt, Sri Ramakrishna, the young man, closes his eyes, focuses there, and goes into the deepest meditation that the Hindu scriptures prescribe or subscribe, the highest form of meditation. He enters it instantaneously. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Totapuri. For him to master that meditation, where you be, recognize your essential nature as the spirit and not the body or the mind or the intellect, you rise about it very fast and you become established in that. Totapuri took 40 years of practices, 40 is recorded, before he hit the target. And this boy, in five minutes, has hit the target. He can't believe his eyes. He says, something is weird here, unusual, <coughs> unusual. But he seems to be in deep meditation. I will not disturb him. So he left the room and locked it so that nobody else will go and disturb him. And after a few hours, he gently opened the room, opened the door, hoping that the young says, ah, yes, yes, I've done it, let's come, let's go. The young man is in deep meditation. His face is radiant, shining brightly, absolutely like a statue. At the highest form of meditation, even the bodily functions stop. It is like a piece of log, a rock. He's sitting like that, shining, face is shining, you know he's not dead. Face is shining, and yet there is no movement at all. Even the heart almost stops. Here the link with the body has been severed. The body just carries on on an, on, the, on an automatic gear, but severed. There is no linkage. Totapoi wonders, how can this boy achieve the highest state in such a such short time? Never mind. Close the door. Let him do, sit there. He comes again next day. No change. Food, drink, who cares? This is a piece of wood, piece of rock, steadfast, shining. This is real story, friends, real story in our time. No exaggeration, nothing, no movement. Again, he locks the room, goes away, comes back the third day, nothing. You may think, well, what kind of state is this? Is it a state of kind of inertia, like inert matter, you're you know, stuck like that, like a statue? Mm -hmm. Look, if you ever had a glimpse of this experience, this is the most blissful state. You are in your element, the real element, not the make-believe world that you live in. 
you are given up this shadow existence and you establish yourself in your true being. This is the most blissful state. Bliss is the only word. You are establishing <coughs> that. This is the most exciting, interesting, and, 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 and this is what spiritual is all about, experiential, as, experiential aspect of religion. This young man is established in that, Advait. Highest experience the Hindus, Hindus you know, talk about. After the third day, Tota Puri begins to panic. He said, I will send this boy away and he's not coming back. It is said that in that state, only some people can return. If they've got some important function still to fulfill, they disappear because they couldn't be bothered to re-establish link with the body or the mind. They are in their blissful state. They have lost all the linkage. They don't come back. Tota Puri says, what have I done? I've sent him off. This is, this is terrible. Now this is a true story and this is what they have, they have prescribed in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scripture. They say, you shout as loudly as, as you can in his, in his ears, Hari Om. So that part of the temple was, you know, loudly ringing out with the sound of Hari Om. The Tota Puri is screaming his head off into the ears of the little youngster. Hari Om to bring him down. After a lot of Hari Oms, <laughs> a little bit of movement was seen in the boy. He came out of meditation. He bowed down to his teacher. See, he was a very humble man. This Ramakrishna was humbler than you can imagine. Soft like butter. He bowed down to his teacher. They embraced each other. And Tota Puri was crying tears of joy. My boy, my student, <laughs> you hit the target on the first time. This is incredible. How did this happen? I don't know what's the answer. Because my mommy. <laughs> I was chopping her, but she said, not worry, go for it. I said, this is an incredible story. You see why? Reconciliation between the Dvait and the Advait. See? Now the story doesn't stop there. It goes a stage higher. How can you go any higher than that? Just watch the story. See how the tables are turned. The story goes a stage further. Now, Totapuri doesn't normally stay in any one place for long than, more than a few days. He would, he's supposed to be like a rolling stone. He keeps together, you know, moving on. But here, because he's attracted to this Ramakrishna and see this brilliant boy, he can't move away. He's, at, he's kind of attached. So he stays there for a little longer. Now the story unfolds in an unusual manner because this part, Totapuri, he had not come to teach, he had come to learn. But he was not aware of that. That is why I was kept alive. There was one bit that was missing in Totapuri and he was going to get it. <laughs> this is the bit. You see, whenever Ramakrishna, even after this highest experience of Advait, Ramakrishna would continue to sing the glories of the Mother Goddess, get up in the morning, sing her bhajans, you know, happily, you know, do this, you know, tali, you know, like that. And one day Totapuri saw him in the early morning. He said, my boy, you hit the Advait. You are that, that you're worshipping. You don't need all that. Do you know what language is the, the common language between the Totapur and Ramakrishna was Hindi? So he said, roti thokte ho. You know, this is what he said. You know, they're making chapati. He said, what are you doing? And Ramakrishna smiled. No, I'm just singing the glories of the mother goddess. Totapur smiled. Okay, he's a quaint little boy. Let him. But the story goes, this is the next chapter of the story. is very interesting. On that night, Totapuri had the ab ability to close his eyes and go into the deepest meditation at the flick of a flick of his fingers. It was that easy for him. On that night, Totapuri had great difficulty in getting into meditation. However hard he tried, he get itches here, there, and he's a person with above body consciousness and he's having real body consciousness. He's struggling to get into meditation. He tried all night and he got very annoyed with himself. He's a very powerful personality. So when he got annoyed, he couldn't get into deepest meditation himself. He said, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I cannot be controlled like my body cannot get in my way. I am the spirit. The body is getting in my way. I know what I'm going to do. Now, again, this part of the story comes with health warning. We don't do it. He said, I am going to throw the body away. Discard the body. Spit it out. As I said, we, this is not for us. For Totapuri, he can do it. He said, now he's a tall man. Very majestic personality. How can he get rid of his body? He's going to hang himself on the tree or something. That's not, that's not his style. There's a huge flowing river Ganga. So Totapuri said, easy. Here's the river Ganga. I throw the body in the Ganga. End of it. End of the story. So no more. This body cannot get in my way. I am the spirit. Let's kick it out. So in the middle of the night, 
You see, all this drama is taking place. In the middle of the night, Totapuri says, let's go into the water and throw the body away. Can you believe this? I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. This is a real story recorded properly about 150 years ago. It's not even prehistoric times, recent. So Totapuri started walking into the river Ganga. Normally, it's very, in that part of Kalka, it's very wide, very deep. He starts walking. And of course, after a few steps, you should be able to go underwater and, and throw the body away, let it you know, be washed away. He walks, and the water is less than ankle deep. He goes into the middle of the river, it's still ankle deep. Now, this is a majestic man. Now, this is a majestic man cannot kill himself by throwing into ankle deep water and then you know, putting his face and I'm drowning, I'm drowning. This is not, this is not, this is not on. This is highly, you know, kind of, so Totapuri said, this is not enough water here for me to drown. Let me go further up. He went to the other bank of the river, right, went to right across, and there was not enough water to drown. This was getting out of hand. And Totapuri said, getting really annoyed, he said, this is terrible. I can't even throw the body away. There's not enough water in the Ganga to you know, wash my body away. This is ridiculous. Something is happening. Something is wrong here. He looked around. Story. He looked around. He said, ah. Everywhere he looked, he saw the mother goddess smiling, laughing loud, out aloud. And Totapuri said, this is magic here. <laughs> I can't even get rid of my own body at my will. And I am the Advaiti. I am the one who is establishing good experience as myself. This is ridiculous. He smiled. He said, I have learned my lesson. He walked back, sat in front of his dhuni, in a little fire that he lights, and sat there smiling. Early in the morning, Ramakrishna came out of his room, smiling. He knew what had happened already. <laughs> he came near Totapuri. Totapuri said, my boy, teach me one or two versions of your mother goddess. I saw her, I saw her last night. I can't avoid her. <laughs> and Ramakrishna smiled. Let me tell you the discussion between the guru and the disciple. You see who is the guru and who is the disciple now. And see how, in what simple, simple language Sri Ramakrishna explains the highest philosophy. He says, he gives the story of Ram, Sita and Lakshman going into the forest. Look at the narrative, he's, he's a master of narrative, this Ramakrishna. He says, it's like this. When Ram, Sita and Krishna are walking in the forest, they were walking in a single file. Ram would be leading, Sita would be the middle and Lakshman would be at the end. This is how they used to go into the forest. You see now, Lakshman has tremendous love of Ram. You see the love that Lakshman has for Ram is unbelievable. Tremendous. So while they are walking, Lakshman misses Ram because Sita gets in the way. Because he must catch sight of his ideal from time to time to get sustenance, to get his life back in. So he keeps missing his Ram. So he keeps looking, you know, kind of down, down, you know, kind of, you know, very distressed. And Sita looks back. She says, ah, I know why he's distressed. She steps aside for Lakshman to have a catch, to catch a glimpse of his ideal Ram. From time to time, she moves aside for, so that Lakshman can catch a glimpse of his ideal Ram, Sri Ram. Ah, says Ram Krishna, this is the story of Mother Goddess and your Atman and Brahman. Unless... Mother Goddess steps aside. You can't even recognize you are the Atman or the Brahman. <laughs> you as the individual, when you wish to link with your true self, your ideal, unless Mother Goddess plays ball with you, you will not get it. <laughs> so this Mother Goddess, this Dwait idea and the Advait idea are closely linked. This again and again becomes visible in the story of Ramakrishna. He says, you can assert you are the Atman, you can assert you are the Brahman, you are Brahman, you are the manifestation of Brahman. These philosophic ideas are fine, but there is an intermediary, and that intermediary is no different from Brahman. And that, you see, again, this idea of vilifying Maya, this is not a vilifying thing. The only way the spirit becomes visible is through Maya, and it is through Maya that you transcend. This is the idea. See, again, this, this, this reconciliation comes through this marvelous story. So, when this Totapuri was successful, this was not because of his effort, but there was somebody who was saying, okay, my boy, you can catch a glimpse of Atman. Somebody was helping him. And when Totapuri said, no, I will throw my body away, the other person, you can't even throw your body away <laughs> until I let you. <laughs> Such a lovely story. 
the linkage between Dvait and Advait, visible in the story of Ramakrishna. The story continues. Now you see, the, here we see the linkage between the Bhakti Marg and the Gnana Marg. And again, not Gnana Marg is, is a dry philosophy, you know, kind of, you know, material, but experiential as Advait, as, as experience of Advait, become very kind of closely knitted together in the story of Ramakrishna. The story, let us continue with the story. You see, as we carry on, we find a very variety of different personalities coming on the stage and interacting with this particular personality. And in the process, we discover how Hinduism kind of unfolds on the, on, on the modern, in the modern world. And we are going to see the next stage of the story. So here we find Ramakrishna reconciling the Bhakti Marg with the Gnan Marg, the Dvait with the Advait. He is now reconciling various strands of Hinduism in one life. In one life he is able to you know, move from one to the other without any, any problem at all. Kind of literally, you know, you know, whiz through all the variety of different pathways the Hindus are promoting. Variety of different bhakti marks he practices and immediately attains its, its, its conclusion successfully. The story has to continue. You see, this personality has come not only to reconcile the various strands of Hinduism, he has come to reconcile various religions too. Now he, we come across, a, a, another personality comes to the Dakshineshwar temple. This person is a Sufi, a Muslim. In that particular temple, Muslims were welcome. They, used to, they, were, give, they were fed, given separate food, and they were allowed to stay in the, in the, in the guest house there. So an unusual person, a Sufi, arrives on the scene. And Ramakrishna is very astute. In no time he catches, atten he, his, his attention is drawn by this individual because he sees kind of culmination of that particular practice in his life very visibly. So he went to him, a very guileless person. He said, I want to learn about Islam. I wish to learn about your tradition. The person says, sure. Now this is the rule. These are the rules of Islam. This is what we study. We study the Quran, and we worship. You know, we we, do, we we pray so many times a day. We eat this kind of food. Ramakrishna said, "I'll follow that." Now, whatever he wanted to do, he would achieve very fast. And somehow, in all the different parts of the story, I find that he is able to achieve his target in literally three days. Anything he starts, finishes, comes to conclusion within three days. So there's a magic number, three days. So for three days, this Ramakrishna doesn't visit the mother goddess. He gives up the idea of being Hindu completely. He wears a lungi. He's sitting out with this, the, the Sufi guy outside, you know, praying so many times a day, eating the Muslim food and everything, and behaving like a Muslim. Couldn't be bothered about the Hindu deities. Three days he spends like that. At the end of three days, this is a, this is, these are his words. He said, I had a majestic experience. I saw a person with a long beard appear in front of me. And I don't know who that is. But then immediately my mind went from the, the idea of God with form into God without form and merged into that. And that experience that I had is no different from the experience I have when I follow the Hindu tradition. In three days I achieved that. And this is unusual. Because there is nobody in the history of mankind who has been able to successfully practice variety of different pathways within one tradition, let alone tradition of other religions. Here is the beginning. The story doesn't stop there. I told you, he is here to reconcile vast number of different approaches in spirituality. In no time, in a short time, he comes across another person who is saying, Shambhu Malik. He says, I'd like to study the Bible. So Ramakrishna says, fine, I want to learn about Christ and these Christian people. So he would visit his house and the gentleman Shambhu Malik would read through the story of the Bible and Ramakrishna, even though he disliked the word sin, he's quite offended by the word sin, just sits through and listens to the story of the Bible, listens. Again in three days, three days, this thing like magic happens in his life. Three days is the magic, magic time. While he's sitting, in one of these you know, devotees' house, there is an image of baby Christ with Madonna on the wall and he's staring at it. 
and that image seems to have come alive and from it he sees rays entering his body, entering his system. He feels very charged up, very unusual experience. For these three days again he doesn't visit the temple, doesn't look at the Hindu deities, completely ignores them. On the third day when he's walking in the little forest in the north of the temple, while he's sitting there, he suddenly sees a person, a white man, walking towards him. And he says, this is strange, who is this foreigner coming towards me? As he comes closer, his heart springs you know, into joy. He says, ah, I know who is this. And this is the man who gave his life for the welfare of humanity, who sacrificed his life for the welfare of humanity. This is Jesus. He said, ah. And as he said that, that, that man came very close to him, embraced and disappeared into him, inside him. If I tell the story to Christians, they will be very worried. Because this means that Christ is contained in Ramakrishna. <laughs> but I've done this story. He enters his body and disappears into him. The same happened every time he had any spiritual experience within in the Hindu tradition, whether he saw Ram or he saw Krishna, these personalities would come and enter his system. And this has happened, this happened. And there's something very unusual about this story. I'll tell you why. Somebody was doing research whether Jesus is a historic figure or a made, made up figure, because there is an argument going on in the theological circles that Jesus is possibly not a real character, but made up. There is a real debate going on. Now you see, those people approached me, I'm telling you, and say we like the story of Ramakrishna because he validates Jesus. <laughs> he says there was a person called Jesus. Do you know to what extent he validates Jesus? He said I can describe Jesus, but Jesus, he was a Jew, and the Jews have a kind of nose kind of which is kind of bent like that, you know, like in the eagle's beak. But I can tell you this this Jesus I saw had a had a stubby nose. But he was looking, he was handsome, he said. He didn't look ugly. But he had a stubby nose, not a pointed nose like this. And you see, he's describing Jesus. And there is no historic record. But the various versions of Christianity, one version talks of Jesus not with a kind of Jewish nose, but with a flat nose. I'm just telling you what has been recorded. Take it as you like. So in one life we see a variety of different approaches visible in the story of one life. Now you see, suppose as a devout Hindu, somebody who is, who is in love with this Ramakrishna, talks about Ramakrishna like this, you might say, well, sounds good and okay. One of the most astute historians in the Western world, called Sir Arnold Toynbee, says the following about Sri Ramakrishna, because they had looked through the story of Ramakrishna. And these are, his, these are his words. He says, the, the comprehensive level of spiritual experience visible in the story of Ramakrishna has not, cannot be, is, is incomparable to anybody in the history of mankind. In the life of this one personality, we see such vast variation of spiritual experience reconciled. And this is something not not, that's something that has not been achieved by any human being in the history of mankind. This is the highest tribute anybody can pay. And this, what, this is what comes out through somebody very famous in the Western world called Sir Arnold Toynbee. Again, you see, this is not an exclamation of a kind of expression of kind of my personal devotion. The reason why this is crucial in the modern times is this. An issue can arise that, look, you are talking that the old religions are good, but how do you know they, are, they lead you to the same destination? How can you be sure? Let me put it in a pointed manner. One of the examples given in pluralism means there are many pathways to the same goal is this. They say that, well, it's like, you know, different people climbing the top of the mountain using different pathways. This is what different religions are like. They're all reaching the toward the top, but using different pathways to climb the same mountain. Metaphor. And this metaphor can be challenged, and I've been challenged, saying that how do you know it's the same mountain? Maybe they're climbing up different mountains. How can you be sure? It's a serious challenge, philosophic challenge. How can you be sure? Pluralism. Suppose I say, you see, all of us, different religions, we are coming, trying to come out of this door, but we have different direction. We could look, if you point to the door, all of you will have different direction, because they're a different starting point. That's what religions are. Different pathways to reach to the same destination, come out of the same door. 
But you may say, Jay, this is an interesting thing, but I can give you a different metaphor. There are lots of other doors. Maybe people are using different doors to come out. How do you know the same door? Same issue. So when you use a metaphor, it can be challenged. And this is how pluralism can be challenged. <clears throat> and do you know where's the resolution? Not through intellectualizing. The resolution lies with this man. This is the only proof of pluralism. The only validity given to pluralism comes by, by this person. And not me, Sir Arnold Toynbee is telling you that. This is the proof of pluralism. That we are coming out, reaching out to the same destination. Look, look let me show you. This is Sri Ramakrishna studied Islam without any hesitation. He studied Christianity without any hesitation and hit the, hit the high note very quickly within three days. He looked at Jainism, commented on Buddhism, on Sikhism. He has touched, if you like, the, if you like, the variety of different expressions of spirituality in his life, experienced them, made them experiential, not intellectual, in one life. <coughs> the variety of different forms that the Hindus offer for making spiritual progress, of course the two major ones, Bhakti and Gnan, very visible in his life. This idea of relating to the ultimate reality as, as Mother Goddess. Relating to the ultimate reality as a little child, relating to the ultimate reality in a variety of different forms, visible in his own life. Not stopping there. Relating to your essential nature as a spirit, Atman. Again, you may think these are, these are in contradiction. Again, reconcile in one life. Can, can move from here to there in no time, with a click of a finger. One lifetime. All of this reconcile, kind of tied together in a seamless manner, makes religion come alive. This is the modern vision of religion. You see, whenever these kind of super personalities appear in, with us, they present the ideas, that they kind of invoke the ideas that are relevant in our times. They do not talk about antiquated religion, they talk about the role of religion in the times that we live in. This person has already offered the reconciliation between different religious ideas in one lifetime, brought into, brought into reality through experience, not through intellect, through experience, first-hand experience, reaching the same destination. So, there is one little story I must tell you. I am going ahead a little bit, fast-forwarding a little bit. When this picture was taken, let me tell you the story about this picture. This guy did not like to be photographed. He was very shy. He would not like anybody to take his picture. And one day he was sitting in front of the Radha Krishna temple in Dakshineshwar and some devotees brought in a photographer. They said, how do we photograph him? I said, you know, easiest way. Mention the word God to him and he goes into meditation. Then we can capture him. <laughs> and this is what they do. They say, talk about God. If you went near him and mentioned the word God, Ishwar, you know, anything, any devotee, you mention any name, he flies off into highest meditation. Immediately, instantaneously, you can't stop him. So they start talking about God and off he goes. He's sitting cross-legged and goes into meditation. And while he's going into meditation, loses body consciousness, but somehow he is not perhaps stable, he's beginning to topple over this way. This is a true story behind this picture. He's beginning to topple over. So the photographer ran near him and with his hand he tried to lift this part of his body, you know, this part, the chin, he tried to lift him up. And the photographer, you know, got a shock. Do you know why? As he tried to do that, he seemed to actually lift the whole body. It was light as a feather. This is real. He was shocked. He said, I don't know. They say in the Tantra, they say that, you know, you can become lighter than a feather. This guy is like that, you know. <laughs> so the moment he started, and he just lifted him a little bit, and quickly took this picture. This is a picture of Ram Krishna in meditation. First time an image of a God-man. First time, not an artist's impression, a real black and white photograph taken of a, of a God-man in the deepest of meditation. And when this picture, this man was weird, this Ramakrishna was weird fellow, I can say so because he's, I'm close enough to him, <laughs> he will excuse me. When this picture was shown to him, again you may smile, do what you like. He looked at the picture and said, ah, this picture will be worshipped in many homes in days to come. It will not only be worshipped by the Hindus, but a lot of white people will be worshipping this image. You see, when he said it, people are going, he's lost his marbles, you know, now this old man in this little temple, his picture go to Western world and they'll be worshipping him. Let me tell you, in our lifetimes, you will see this image 
becoming very universal, very visible. I'm very pleased this image is here because through this media, it will already go into many homes. This Ramakrishna had said, if you have shed a tear in the name of God, in this life or even any previous life, you will come across him because he comes with the, with the, with the, with the tickets. <laughs> if you sh shed tears in the name of God, you will come across this Ramakrishna. So what I'm telling you, all of you, including the viewers, you are all crybabies. <laughs> you must have cried for God in some, at some stage in your life. That's why you are hearing the story of this Ramakrishna. Spirituality, vibrant, relevant in our own times, visible, exciting and real. Religion becomes real when you st study the story of Ramakrishna. You see, as Swami Vivekan said, it is very difficult. You see, you see the breadth of vision of this individual, tremendous broad ideas of spirituality. Most, as, as Arnold Toynbee said, the, the broadest you have seen in the, in the history of mankind. But his depth is something that nobody has been able to measure. So what I am doing is really a very puny you know, attempt to try and measure his depth. You know, what's it like? You go to the seaside, there's the infinite ocean, you know, the huge ocean. And we come with our little pictures, a little vessel with which we fill the sea water. Somebody has got, just got a spoon, someone got a slightly bigger bowl, somebody may have a large drum. You see, when we try and, try and fathom this Ramakrishna, we don't actually succeed in doing that. We show our own limitations, mm -hmm. our own capacity to understand spirituality. People don't realize that. So whenever we try and pass judgment on this personality, we are actually showing our, our own depth, not his depth, our depth. And I'm not saying this, Swami Vivekananda said that. He said, I am struggling to fathom the depth of this personality. So even though it may appear, you know, kind of, kind of supernatural stories, the material is very genuine. This, there is no make-believe here. It is serious stuff. This is religion in our life, in our times, coming alive. And you see, all the individuals who enter the story of Ramakrishna, in a way, relate to all of us, because we can relate to these characters, these personalities. And as we go on, more and more vibrant personalities will enter the, enter the system. I was still not even touched on 16 disciples, the apostles of Sri Ramakrishna. In this session, they will not appear, but in the next session, they will appear. They'll make the grand entrance, and you'll see how dramatic they are. Each one was an individual, highly unique, and yet expresses the kind of, you know, kind of aspiration that we all possess. And how do we relate to the idea of spirituality? When you go to the doorway, this personality which allows us to glean through and understand spirituality at a deeper level. And this is why it's such a lovely story. Let me carry on. Now, what was the state of Calcutta in his time, let me tell you? Or what was the state of India in his time? India was struggling. It had two invasions, the Muslim invasion and then the European invasion. It was losing its integrity, its own self-confidence. It was all at, at a low ebb. And the idea, the broad ideas of Hinduism were about to be thrown out, jettisoned in his own lifetime. This man is blissfully unaware of all this politics. But the ideas are being kicked out. And two major movements sprang up in India. One is called the Arya Samaj and the other is called the Brahmo Samaj in Bengal. Both these movements in a way were trying to appease the Abrahamic vision of, of a religion. They both said idea of God with form is a mistake. So all your Ram, Krishna, Mother Goddess, should be abandoned, we should take their images and let them float down the river Ganga, let them go. We must go back to the Vedas and the idea of God not possible with form. This was being adopted very fast throughout India because these two movements were spreading very fast, Arya Samaj and the Brahmo Samaj. And now we see this young, this, this man, this priest of the Kali temple interacting with the Brahmo Samaj and you see what happens next. Very unusual is this story. And I told you, one man established in God realization can not only move mountains, he can climb 100 Himalayas and, and get through without any difficulty. Why? Because religion is a matter of experience. Whenever you come across individuals talking about spirituality from experience, show respect, friends. But that is the heart of religion. 
it is through experience that this becomes valid. Otherwise, it's all make believe. It is all speculation. With the reality, experience gives it true reality. Now we see the story. First of all, let me just tell you something more about this Ramakrishna. He has now kind of already practiced variety of different pathways to spirituality, including other religions, <coughs> and he succeeded very fast, literally within three days. In some cases, instantaneous success. So the field is ready now. It is time to promote this broader vision into the greater society. And this is the next stage of the story. Now, this Ram Krishna, whenever he finds any individual in Calcutta who is sincere about religion, serious about spirituality, will go to visit him. They don't come to visit him. He goes to visit them. You know, Swami Dhyanan Saraswati appeared on the stage in Calcutta at this time. Dhyanan Saraswati didn't go looking for Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna went looking for Dhyanan Saraswati. Keshav Chandra Sen, who is the leader of the Brahma Samaj, very popular, can draw 100,000 people, crowds come to listen to him, he's a fantastic orator. All people kind of crowd around him. Nobody's heard the name of this priest of Dakshineshwar. Who is this Ramakrishna? Un unheard of. Everybody crowds around Keshav Chandra Sen and this huge movement called the Brahma Samaj, the modern face of Hinduism, which is discarding the idea of God with form, formless God only. Everybody flocking to him. This is kind of rational, positive way of thinking about religion in his time. And do you think he's going to bother this Keshav Chandra Sen to come and visit Ramakrishna in Dakshineshwar temple, this priest, illiterate, pri illiterate priest? No way. But this Ramakrishna won't let him off. He goes to visit him. First time, when he heard that he's living about two miles away from the Dakshineshwar temple, he told his Bhaniya, you know, Radai, come, Radai, let's go and visit this God man. He likes to suss them out. And this is how they go. First Radai, look at the guileless manner of this man. First Radai will go in and announce. He says, my mama, my uncle, maternal uncle, wishes to come and see you. He'll send him ahead of him. Wishes to see you. My mama spends his time thinking about God and he has heard that you also spend your time thinking about God, so he wants to interact with you. That's a lovely language. It's a simple language. Not that it's a God-realized personality of super, you know, caliber. This is how he introduces mama. And then mama comes and starts interacting. And now Keshav Chandra Sen and the Brahma devotees are looking at this man, unusual fellow. They're not that impressed. Who is this man? And then we see when Ramakrishna opens his mouth, the atmosphere falls silent, you know, everybody's captivated. You see, a person who talks of spirituality from experience has got such a certain power in his voice, certain sweetness that permeates, that enters the system very fast. So he starts talking. And then, you know, as soon as he says, Keshav Chandra Sen's devotee says, Keshav Babu, you must reply, respond. But this Kesho is no ordinary devotee. He realizes what he's dealing with. And do you know what he says? He says, shush, I can't lecture in front of this man. It is like selling, these are his words, needles to the blacksmith. They already have enough needles. <laughs> you don't do that. You listen, you don't give, you don't lecture him, you listen to him. So everybody keeps silent. And do you know what's the first conversation? first conversation, the Brahma devotee says, God cannot be both with, with, with and without form. Can't be like the true. Straight philosophic challenge. And this Ramakrishna, this rustic Ramakrishna, using the simplest metaphor, and remember this is the metaphor used now in GCSE level, in Hinduism textbook, in A level. This is where I pinched it from. It's plagiarism, plagiarism. <laughs> this is where it comes. Keshav and the same dialogue. Just at that time, ice was being brought from the North Pole, you know, with large, in large steamers, were drifting, you know, brought to Calcutta. So ice was visible in Calcutta. So this is the example given by Sri Ramakrishna. He said, oh, Kesho, listen to me. The same God is both formless as well as with form. It is the love of the devotee that freezes the formless God into the form of his desire. It is like ice and water, my boy, ice and water. The same thing which is formless and underpins this reality. When the devotee has tremendous love, that devotee, don't under, 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 underestimate the power of the devotee. He freezes the formless God. He reduces the formless God to become, take on a form of his choice and play with him and interact with him. How can he say that? Because he was doing it day and night. <laughs> with the mother goddess, with all these various forms of gods and goddesses, he was playing with them. He was generating them. 
the love he had brought this mother goddess with form and play and interact with her all, all, all his life. So he could talk like that. And those people mm, muttered, mm, sounds very interesting. And then Ramakrishna, before leaving, says something very interesting. He said, you know, all you guys, your tails have not dropped off, but Kesho's tail has dropped off. <laughs> it's a very rude thing to go and tell the Brahmo leader that your tail has dropped off. And everybody started laughing, a bit worried, and said, is he being rude to our leader? He's telling his tail has dropped off. What do you mean? And Kesho said, shush, let him answer. So Ramakrishna said, look, let me tell you. I looked at all your faces here. You see, let me give you an example. It's like tadpoles. When tadpoles mature, they shed their tails. They can live in the water as well as climb out of water and go on land. This Kesha is the only one who is able, successful in meditation. The rest of you are just, just basically pretending. His tail has dropped off. He is both of this world as well as of the other world. He has experienced spirituality. He is the only one. See, this man is able to suss out instantaneously. Because he comes with that caliber. Anybody goes near him, he can read him inside out. He knows his capacity, his past and his future. He told Kesho, your tail has dropped off. You are the only one successful in meditation. Of course, it rings true because Kesho knows. So now we see this linkage between Ramakrishna and Kesho Chandra Sen and the Brahma Samaj. A very interesting dialogue and relationship developing. Now Kesho comes to visit Ramakrishna in Dakshineshwar. And from time to time, it is very rich and of course very famous, he takes a boat and then they invite Ramakrishna to go on the boat and go on a little tour on the river Ganga. And while they are doing it, they talk of high philosophic things. And who is speaking? Not Kesho, Ramakrishna. And he listens. He is strongly influenced. Because Kesho is influenced, slowly all the other people in Calcutta came to know about Ramakrishna because Kesho would say this is reality, spiritually enlightened personality. So Kesha is now pointing a finger at Ramakrishna saying he's enlightened. Even though he's telling him he's lost his tail. Mm -hmm. But this is becoming visible in the story of Ramakrishna and Kesha Chandra Sen. So the relation becomes closer. And you see he's in a way influencing this major movement to recognize its limitation, to just simply say God with form is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. This is what Ramakrishna insists on. And of course he wins his argument because he's talking from experience. It's not make-believe. It's visible. The story continues. At the same time, Ramakrishna meets... You see, this is also important. In the Hindu tradition, we have got various kind of categories of personalities. You've got the Bhaktas, we've got the Pandits. Now the Pandits will automatically start interfering. This is normal for them. This is their job. So they want to analyze Ramakrishna and what he's saying. So Ramakrishna comes across two kinds of pandits after he kind of interacts with the Keshav Chandra Sen. Two kinds of pandits kind of interact with Ramakrishna. There are the genuine ones. You know who are the genuine pandits? There's somebody called Padma Lochan who visits Ramakrishna. The moment he sees Ramakrishna, he says, Ah, I was studied cart load of books, Shastras. I want to throw them in the Ganga. You are talking from experience. What are these books? They are sh just scribbles. A pundit talking like that about his, 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 his shastras. You are real. Please tell me, teach me. He meets this kind of pundits. And these are very just, you know, I mean, very, very kind of uh, orthodox pundits, Brahmins. One day, one of these pundits was told, Look, Ramakrishna is inviting you to come to the Kali temple for a particular function and the Kali temple belongs to the lower caste. Would you come? And this, this Pandit said, Ah, if Ramakrishna tells me to go and eat in the Bhangi's house, you know, the outcast house, I'll happily go with him. Anywhere he takes me to hell, I'll go, I'll follow him. This is a real Pandit. <laughs>